Thank, thank you, members. Uh, and good order, yes. Good evening, and uh, members, members of the public, officers. Uh, welcome to this planning committee meeting on the 15th of June, 19, uh, 19, 19, 19, 20, uh, Housekeeping, as always, if the fire alarm is activated, please vacate the offices via the stairs, either through the security door to my right or via the stairs where you came into the chamber. Please do not use the lifts. Assemble on Holy Square, the green, virtually opposite the council offices, and if safe to do so, an officer will bring you back in to the meeting. Uh, does anybody intend filming the meeting this evening? Will they please show their hands? No, thank you very much. Uh, restriction of mobile phones. Now, just a little bit different on this one, if I may. Um, as members, once again, and members of the public, I will ask you not to use your phones. Please turn them to silent, and please do not make calls or receive or answer emails during the meeting. Uh, the exception I'm giving tonight is to Councillor Jill Bayford. Um, without too much detail, I do know her daughter is unwell, and... Um, I think it's fair that she, hopefully, she does not re receive any calls regarding her. So, uh, thank you. Members wishing to speak un, um, under well, 20.1 uh, is Councillor Pugh speaking under 5A, on agenda item 5A. Also, I have a Councillor Lees on Item 5C. Are there any other members not on the committee? Sir, I can see you. Can you? Councillor uh, Towning. Thank you, Councillor Towning. It, you're miles up there, and I've got my reading glasses on, so. And I, I know I, I shouldn't ignore him. And item, Councillor Towning. Five, is that 5C as well? Yeah. Thank you. Also remind members and the members of the public that this meeting is being live streamed on uh, the Council's YouTube channel. Uh, public speaking, the following applications have been reserved for public speaking. Would members please note that the following items on their agenda, item 5A, land southwest of of waste processing plant on the Manston Road north of Manston. Item 5B, former British gas site at North Down Road, Broadstairs. And item 5C, 41 Princess Margaret Avenue in Margate. Agenda item one, apologies uh, for this evening's meeting. I have apologies for Councillor Everett, Councillor Keane, uh, Councillor Paul Moore. Are there any other apologies? Sitting in for, do we have anyone sitting in for Councillor Moore or Councillor? No. Okay, thank you. Agenda item two, declarations of interest. Are there any members have interest on the agenda items? Thank you. Agenda item three, minutes of the planning committee meeting held on the 18th of May. Do members agree that the minutes of the planning committee held on the 18th of May 2022 be approved as a correct record? Could I have a proposal, please? Thank you, Councillor Hart. A seconder, please. Councillor George Bayford, uh, do you all agree? Thank you, members. Agenda item four, seven Seacroft Road, Brussels. This was the site visit which we had last week. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Livingston to outline the report. Thank you, Chair. So the 
application is for the erection of a first floor rear extension with a balcony over a single storey rear extension at 7 Seacroft Road. So we have uh, the site outlined in red, as you can see on the screen. You have a neighbour at the rear, which is number nine. Uh, and then you have Joseph's Court, which is the building um, to the uh, right hand side of the image, so to the east of the site. So the main consideration that members wanted to assess was the impact on the living conditions of the property adjacent, which is Joseph Court. So I'll just go through the application uh, just to show members with the photos. So this is the aerial image of the site. So you can see the host site is in the center of the, the image. This is the view from the road of the property in question. So it's not a concern of officers uh, about the impact on the character and appearance of the area from the first floor extension because it's behind this building, so it's not visible in the public realm. Then this is the access down to a communal um, parking area that serves um, Joseph's Court. Um, so the, the window and door that you can see on the left-hand side of the image there serve uh, number number three Joseph's Court which is um, the property that members viewed this is the rear parking area uh, this is the view from that area to where the extension would be so it's above the single story uh, accretion here the center of the image this is the kitchen window uh, that is raised in the report as the, the main consideration as to whether or not there is an impact from the balcony uh, and members were able to access uh, the kitchen uh, to look through that window to see the location of the balcony. This is just a view from in front of that window towards uh, the balcony. And then this is around the other side of Joseph's Court, the access to the other property. Sorry, it's number uh, two and three are accessed there. It's number one uh, that's affected. So this is the location of the extension uh, in the center of the image. Um, this is the side elevation that you could see from the photos. And then this is the proposal. So uh, the application was amended during the course of the submission to increase this, the height of the balustrading to 1.4 meters above the finished floor level of the balcony. Um, and with that balustrading to be obscure glazed, uh, sort of a glazed screen, uh, which would um, avoid any prolonged overlooking if there were tables and chairs that were situated on that balcony. Um, it is considered by officers that the impact on the neighboring property is acceptable by virtue of the existing relationship with, um, if I just skip through to show you the, here we go, um, the existing relationship with the access to the rear area um, as well as um, the angle um, serving uh, from the balcony looking towards that window. Um, this is an image that was provided by the applicant, um, which shows um, the view that you get a little bit lower down than where the window is. Members will recall looking at this image last time uh, at committee. Uh, and this is the, the kitchen window in question. Um, and then this is the floor plan of Joseph's Court. And this is the, uh, the kitchen in question um, that members were able to actually go into and see from. So. In, in officers' opinion, it is uh, not considered that the um, the impact of overlooking is is unacceptable from the proposal, uh, and therefore it is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ian. I move the officers' recommendation for approval is adopted. Could the vice chair please second? I'll second that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Coleman Cook. Uh, members. Any debate? Councillor Bayford. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I have to say I, I didn't think that with the distance involved and the angle of, of, of the um, extension, I, I didn't honestly think that the effect was unacceptable on the neighbouring properties. So I'd be happy to support the application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rozeski. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the site visit, uh, we had a good look around. Uh, normal weather, everything. Um, for a change. For a change, it didn't rain. Um, and looking down on that window, you could see um, the glare coming off it, but you couldn't see inside. So I don't think it's a major issue during the day. Um, so I'll be happy to support the application. 
Thank you, Councillor Rosewski. Are there any other members? Councillor Shrub. Yeah, well, uh, I went to the um, viewing, and as we were uh, at the back of the kitchen, uh, where the dining area is, I could hardly see out that window. So I'll be happy to support this one. Uh, thank you. Are there any other members wish to speak? Thank you, members. Okay, I put this to you. So those in favour of this application, please show their hands. Uh, those against? That is carried. Thank you very much, members. Thank you. Agenda item five is the schedule of planned applications and public speaking. Uh, any site visits will take place for committee members on Friday the 8th of July. And as you know, normally 9.30 in the morning. Agenda item 5A is the application for refusal of land southwest of the waste processing plant, District Park, Manston Road North in Manston, Speaking in favour of the application is uh, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, would you mind uh, speaking, please? And you have three minutes. If you take one thing away from my three minutes, it's this. The ask for District Park is to use 18 acres of farmland that probably doesn't even support one full-time job to be used to support 300 jobs for the next 20 years for minimal highways or environmental impact. Uh, thank you for your time, Chair, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak. Locating Kent has been funded primarily by Kent County Council support employers uh, that are expanding or moving to the region for over 20 years. We fully support the planning application for District Park on the basis it will safeguard 220 people's jobs and provide capacity to create over 80 new ones. During the planning application process, we have consistently made the case for this application on the basis that refusal based on land use and allocation is not in the interest of your community or the wider Kent economy. Point three, of three and four of your office refusal reasons relate to highways. On point three, the proposed scheme is a sustainable location despite the absence of a path. The applicant's detailed travel plan commits to funding a car scheme and crew buses through the Section 106 agreement. Installing a path is particularly expensive and delivers no wider benefits to your community, so it's clearly not viable or necessary. And on point four, the applicant has agreed with KCC Highways to make a Section 106 contribution to the improvements at Spitfire Junction. The main points I wish to address are protecting Thanet's landscape and the loss of agricultural land. Locating Kent has a pipeline of over 20 local manufacturers incapable of expanding due to shortage of employment sites like District Park. Businesses need well-connected sites with buildings that meet modern sustainability standards and provide space for future growth. You should be aware this is a 20 to 30 year investment for the businesses looking at District Park and their decisions need to be made today. Typically, local plans look forward 15 years and take five years to complete. Tonight is your opportunity to fix that imbalance. On point one, as you would expect from the responsible local developer, the applicant spent a lot of time on design. The buildings will be seen against the backdrop of neighbouring uses and screening means minimal impact on the landscape. Therefore, the jobs protected and created through this scheme will outweigh the minor perceived visual harm, and with only one exception, the neighbouring consultees are satisfied this is the case. On point two, sites like these exist close to, not in, settlements. Very few villages or town sites provide expansion space, and in any case are more valuable for residential use. In fact, much of Thanet's proposed urban employment land has been lost to residential use. Despite this, your recently adopted local plan allows for thousands of houses on greenfield sites. How can it be that employment doesn't receive the same greenfield treatment? As your local plan stands, employment land stock is smaller now than it was in 1998 before your recently planned housing was anticipated. Alternative sites are unavailable or unviable right now. These businesses cannot wait for planning policy to catch up with today's needs. District Park is a bespoke. Carry on. Thank you. District Park is a bespoke design for the businesses, and within 15 minutes of their workforces, the site can be serviced and has good strategic highway connections. As I said at the start, if you take one thing away from the, my three minutes, is this: the ask for District Park is to use 18 acres of farmland that doesn't support even one full-time job. 
to be used to support 300 jobs for the next 20 years for minimum highways and environmental impact. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ryan. Uh, speaking as Ward Councillor is Councillor Pugh. Councillor Pugh. Thank you, Chair. That's certainly, uh, thank you, Mr. Ryan. It's certainly a hard act to follow, um, and I'll try not to, um, you know, overlay uh, much with what Mr. Ryan has said. Um, you know, I think it's in incredibly important this application is supported um, as the ward councillor, um, not only for the villages but also as cabinet member for economic development. I'm contacted on almost a weekly basis by businesses that are looking to move into the area, and we don't have the space or the, nor the capacity. I know that. The Maple Leaf Business Park, um, further down the other side of Manston Airport, you know they can't build the commercial units quick enough. Um, you know they're going up as quickly as they can, and they're they're filling them almost straight away. So you know I do completely appreciate the the lack of commercial units and space um, across the district. Um, my main concern, and I understand why the officer recommendation is as it is, um, but this designate this the reason for refusal was that the land is designated as agricultural land. And I think the incredibly important point to make, as Mr. Ryan has done, is that you know we've got thousands of homes designated on our agricultural land, and I know I have, as a ward councillor, many times other applications when I've um, been insisting or hoping that this committee would refuse a residential scheme. You know, my argument has always been, you know, where are the jobs for all these people? Where are the jobs for all these new houses? You know, if we can put more significant weight to building our agricultural land uh, just for residential use. You know, I find it intriguing that we're going to reject this on a on a technicality to do with the policy of the local plan, um, when this is an opportunity to bring hundreds of new jobs into the area and try and not scare away businesses that want to come here and invest invest in Thanet. Um, moving on to my other point about policy, and I appreciate that uh, clarification may be given to this later. But you know, another reason was uh, from the officer's recommendation. The reasons was um, the contravention and contravening of policy, particularly to do with highways and the Spitfire Junction. Now, I can tell you, as the ward councillor, that you know there's not a residential application that comes in my ward that KCC aren't trying to get the applicant to pay for improvements to Spitfire Junction. It's been happening for as long as I've been a councillor, so for at least the last five or six years. Um, you know, and not one time has any either any money been allocated or has, has that junction changed. You know, I think it's a bit rich now for us to try and be insisting on, applica on an applicant to make improvements to that junction or not least refuse it on that policy technicality. And I appreciate that may have changed, but I just wanted to, to highlight that. You know, it's a point of frustration for me. Um, I think moving on as well, and you know, I'll try and, I'll try and be quick. Um, you know, this is the land that is owned by the applicant. We've already got DDS Group adjacent to the site. Um, there is already commercial kind of units, as you would say, um, close to that that were a few, quite a few years ago, not that many years ago, actually, uh, built on agricultural land. Um, as the ward councillor, I've received no complaints from residents about this. Um, I'm incredibly supportive, particularly of the, the bund and the significant planting that's going to be put in place um, for this site. And I think it's important that the committee uh, understands and appreciates uh, the economic benefit that this will bring to the area, particularly in a ward where many people travel outside of work, outside of this ward to go to work. Um, it's an area where I've received no real complaints, um, particularly to do with traffic movements or heavy goods vehicles. Um, you know, in particular, as I said, about the Spitfire Junction, and therefore I'm hoping and praying um, that planning committee members will support this and approve this application. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pugh. The, the officer now will give his report, which I believe is in. Thank you, Chair. So the planning application is for the erection of a series of uh, general industrial buildings with associated open storage. So the red line on the image that you can see outlines the site. So just to put members in, in the location of the site, um, just to the south, uh, sort of southeast of the red line site is the northern grass part of the Manson Airport site. So down in the the bottom left of the image is the uh, Spitfire Junction. Um, so going up the Manston Road part, that's the Margate part of Manston Road. Um, and you know, the site is outlined in red. So the site is outside the urban confines and in the countryside. 
Uh, this is a satellite image taken from Google just to show uh, the existing. So the existing DDS uh, site uh, is uh, in the center of the image, so where the mouse cursor is moving around. Um, next to it is a site sort of um, which is the secure storage solutions site um, with the site in question uh, application around the, the rear, sort of between this site and the Charles River site, which is further to the uh, to the southwest, also extending out past the existing uh, rear boundary of the uh, of the DDS site. So the main issues for this application are the uh, principal development, so the impact on the countryside and loss of agricultural land, uh, the impact on the landscape character area, the economic benefits of the proposal, uh, the impact on highways and transportation and the sustainability of the site, uh, as well as the other matters, the sort of standard planning matters of impact on living conditions of the residential properties, which you can obviously see that a sort of sporadic form of development along Manston Road, as well as the other issues of ecology, drainage, archaeology. Uh, etc. So this is a, an image provided by the applicant which shows the extent of the site as superimposed onto uh, a satellite image just to show you the context. So the proposed development would, would use the existing access for um, that, that's present for uh, secure storage solutions um, to access the, the site here. This is the proposed layout of the site. So as mentioned, using the existing access, uh, going in, you've got an internal route, and then there are three sort of sections of the proposal with landscaping around the outside of the site, as well as a, um, a, an area of sort of designated open space, uh, which is sort of next to where a, the sort of commercial residential development that's, that's to the fronting Manston Road in the corner. So what I'm just going to do is go through each section of the site which relates to the individual businesses that have been cited as, as going on to this site. So starting with uh, site one. So uh, this is uh, a, a commercial development of, of B2 general industrial use. It's, it's 7,220 square metres over two separate buildings. Uh, so you can see here, um, this has been put forward um, as uh, the operator of uh, OFP timber, manufacturing timber frames for house building. So that's what it's cited in the application for. Um, and you can see, obviously, there's some mock-ups there with the logo on the actual premises itself. Um, the scale of the building, though, is obviously going to be fixed in the appearance of it. So this has been put forward uh, with composite cladding and, and a steel roof. And all the buildings have the same materials, but with variations in terms of the color of cladding. And sometimes the cladding is horizontal as opposed to vertical. So the height of this building is um, it's about 5.5 to the eaves with the 7.6 to the ridge of this building. Um, then in terms of the layout of, of the, the sort of this part of the site, you've got uh, 123 spaces, car parking spaces serving this particular unit, six lorry spaces and, and 46 uh, um, cycle spaces that are being provided. So from the figures that were submitted with the application when it was submitted, uh, in 2020, um, it's stated that 75 uh, people were currently employed at this business in the in the district, and that this this moving would generate an additional 20 employees on top of that. Now, some of those figures are, are slightly different to the ones that have been mentioned, but this is what was put in with the application. So, just these are the the floor plans, just showing the production area on the ground floor of building A, with um, this uh, roof plan showing the roof lights um, and then you've got building B which is obviously similar sort of design for production purposes uh, and then the production area on the floor plans there. So looking then at site two, so this is a building totaling uh, 9,231 square meters for general industrial use. Uh, it doesn't name the, the company that would be looking to go into this premises, but it does mention that it's a, a local business uh, to the district. Um, so the design of the building is similar to the design of the other buildings. So we've got the, the composite cladding with the steel roof, but you can see that this building is a different different sort of shape by virtue of its its long but but quite thin to reflect a production line for the general industrial use so this building is similar in 
height. Um, so it's, it's 7.9 meters to the ridge with 5.5 to the eaves. Uh, and in this instance, um, you have 152 car parking spaces, 55 cycle spaces, six lorry bays, and 10 motorbike spaces. So you can see then a detailed layout being provided with, uh, you know, with warehouse storage as well as the actual production line uh, on the right hand side of the image. Uh, and so using the, the statistics provided, <clears throat> this is stated to have um, 80 currently employed in 2020. Uh, it doesn't indicate any information uh, showing any additional roles to be created through this um, proposal. Not to say that they wouldn't be uh, necessarily. Uh, and then site three, which is the smallest part of the site. So this is in the uh, top of the image. Uh, so the northern part of the site. Um, so you've got one building here, um, which has been put forward uh, under the old B1A use class, which is office, uh, which is now use class E, G in uh, the new use classes order, uh, and that totals uh, 278 square meters, so more of a sort of office, small sort of area, uh, with then uh, an area of about 185 um, square meters for scaffold racking, because this is proposed to be put forward for a, a scaffolding firm based in Margate All Access Scaffolding. Um, and so, again, similar design to what we've looked at, uh, but with the, the horizontal cladding uh, of a different color, um, with uh, 6.8 meters to the ridge, so a little bit smaller than the other buildings, uh, and 4.9 meters to the eaves. And so there are 15 parking spaces for this uh, this proposal. Um, and this is has, was put forward in 2020 as having 60 current employees, uh, with a couple of additional employees added from the proposal. So, and this is just the uh, elevations of the scaffold rack uh, that's there. Um, so, as you've already heard, um, a lot of um, consideration has been put forward by the applicant with regards to the uh, ability for these operators to go onto the allocated sites in the, the local plan um, uh, and their inability to find a, a suitable site as put forward. So, the site isn't allocated in the local plan for any development. Um, and it doesn't fall within any of the criteria in uh, policy SP24, which is the development in the countryside policy. Um, there is a specific policy related to new business in the countryside, which is policy uh, E13 uh, of the local plan, which states that well-designed new development for economic development purposes for new businesses will be permitted in sustainable locations at a scale, form, and compatible with their rural location. So that is a consideration for this, uh, this application. Um, so the report outlines that there has been information provided, uh, a number of different submissions of information provided by the applicant uh, to state the lack of available sites uh, or spaces on the allocated employment sites as shown on the, the slide that you can see, which are the allocated sites in the local plan, to cover the development of the three businesses. Uh, and that has included an assessment of each of those main sites. So it's included Manston Business Park, the Westwood Industrial Estate, the Pisons Road Industrial Estate. Um, and predominantly, they have been discounted on the basis of the size of the ask of, of what these three businesses would need um, going on to these sites um, in particular, uh, and that that is prohibitive. So concerns raised in the report from officers um, that the assessment of these alternative sites is based on all three businesses being located together rather than looking at if any of them individually could go on to any of the sites that are vacant. Um, because of that, uh, officers still feel that policy SP04, which is the strategic policy uh, about where uh, economic development or these sorts of uses should go, um, and parameters for economic development, um, which is obviously based for the local plan on an, an evidence strategy to 2031, should still be given significant weight um, when considering this application. Notwithstanding that, though, there is a consideration here about the economic benefits of the development, which must be taken into account by members. Um, and obviously, in terms of what's, what's been stated in the application, that, that includes 22 new jobs as stated in the application. Obviously, we've heard from the the, uh, the representative or, or uh, separate from locating Kent um, indicating there are 80 new jobs to be created. Uh, but primarily the argument has been put forward that this is the retention of jobs that are already in the district uh, to the tune of what's stated in the original application submission of, of 215. 
So the application site, um, as mentioned, is a mix of grade one and grade two agricultural land, and the applicant has submitted a uh, agricultural land uh, assessment. Um, and so grade, grade one and grade two is, is excellent to very good, best, uh, most versatile agricultural land. Now, policy E16 uh, identifies the test for the loss of agricultural land. Uh, and I'll just read from that policy. Um, it states that except on sites allocated for development by virtue of other policies in the plan, uh, planning permission will not be granted for significant development which would result in the irreversible loss of best and most versatile agricultural land unless it can be clearly demonstrated that the benefits of the proposed development outweigh the harm resulting from the loss of agricultural land. Uh, there are no otherwise no otherwise suitable sites for, of poorer agricultural quality that can accommodate the development. And three, the development will not result in the remainder of the agricultural holding becoming uh, not viable or lead to a likely accumulated or significant loss of higher quality agricultural land. Well, the argument's been put forward that it's a, a sort of, it consolidates the uh, existing use that's, that's, that's there um, with new businesses. And obviously you've heard from a uh, representative uh, that the benefits should outweigh the loss of the agricultural land. Now, Members' of attention is drawn to the application that was submitted quite a, quite a number of years ago now, um, and so it's not relevant in terms of the local plan as, as it stands, but it was a 2005 application which looked to actually develop this, this site and expanding all the way to the boundary of this site on the uh, west, uh, sort of northwest of this site, uh, which was put forward at that time for, um, for commercial use, um, and actually at that point was refused for the loss of best and most versatile land. Um, notwithstanding that, though, again, it still falls to a consideration on the basis of the MPPF and, and the local plan. The, the concerns from officers, again, come back to that assessment on the basis of three businesses together, which are separate in, in user, rather than separately individually looking at those businesses and whether or not they can be accommodated elsewhere before you end up losing uh, irreversibly the agricultural land. Um, and therefore, we don't consider it has been demonstrated that these, there, there couldn't be alternative sites. Indeed, sites of potentially poor agricultural land, although it is recognised that obviously Thanet, as everyone knows, is abundantly uh, grade one and grade two. So it is, you know, it's the higher quality. Uh, and so it's for members to decide whether or not there is harm as a result of this development um, that, um, you know, should be taken into account. We feel as officers that that harm from the loss of agricultural land should be taken into account in the balance of weighing up the benefits against the, the harm. So in terms of the impact on the countryside, um, this primarily, as, as members will be aware, relates often to a visual impact. So the applicant has submitted a, um, a landscape visual impact assessment with the application. It provided a baseline assessment of the viewpoints as shown on this plan that you can see here. Um, so just to show you, the areas that were identified by the applicant as having high sensitivity uh, relate to viewpoints uh, six, uh, sorry, five, uh, six, seven, uh, and, and ten. Um, so the green line that you can see um, coming off of Manston Road is a bridleway. Um, this um, obviously accesses all the way down to, um, to other, the other bridleway, and then the, the road network uh, sort of runs from Vincent Road across the field. Um, as well as obviously you've got a viewpoint from number seven here, which is a viewpoint from um, the actual sort of corner of, of Vincent Road. So just looking at viewpoints uh, five and six that was submitted in the applicant submission. Um, so first thing to note here is that this image was taken in February 2020. So it's February, so it's winter. Uh, and there are images, though, later on from today that show the amount of screening that's actually there. Uh, right now. So uh, just to go through this though to give you a context of what's on the DDS demolition site. So this is an image just showing sort of straight on the, the, the northern elevation of the DDS demolition site. So this is the image at the top that you can see here. Uh, the application site uh, spreads sort of from the right hand side outwards. So to give you an idea of what heights we're talking about, the building that's next to the sort of in the, in the background where the mouse pointer is, um, is a, is a two-story modular building that was approved but it was around 2014, um, which is 5.5 metres high. So you can see that there's another warehouse building that's a bit taller than that. So that gives you a sense of those heights that I mentioned earlier, which in total for Ridge go up to um, 
I put the note down, bear with me, uh, up to a ridge of about uh, 7.9, 7.6, but to eaves of, of 5.5. So it's comparable to those two buildings that you can see in terms of the heights of the buildings uh, that are proposed. Um, so the image on the bottom that you can see is from further down the bridleway, so further to the west, looking back towards the site. Uh, you can see the identified application site um, is um, identified by the arrow here where my mouse pointer is um, so it's an expansion out from that um, from the, the site on the left to the right so you can you can see a, the view there in terms of the landscape character area in terms of this image this is the further back image so we're now um, going further to the north from from number 10 so i'll just go back just to show you where you're looking from so number 10 so the top of your map there looking back towards the site so you can see again the, the dds demolition site in the in the distance you've got a, an, another outcrop site on manston road uh, and that the applicant has put forward the extent of the application site here um, showing the expansion point uh, of across the field to the point that's dotted on the right hand side so um, as mentioned, the landscape visual impact assessment has indicated that there is the need for mitigation to mitigate the impact of developing the site. Uh, again, just to remind you of the layout, um, you have a smaller building that's in the sort of very northern point of the site, and then you have uh, the, the longer building uh, serving the what's, what's put forward as sort of unit two, um, which has um, obviously the eaves of 5.5 and ridge of 7.9. So what's being proposed is a landscape buffer around the edge of the site. Um, the planting mix is in the bottom left of the image here. Um, this, this mix um, includes um, a number of species which could grow in maturity to, in some instances, between actually 20 and, and 40 metres high. Um, not that that's the intention, I think, to go to 40 metres, but the strategy states that in 10 years, coverage would very clearly be found to uh, alleviate the impact of any um, visual incursion into the countryside, a bit, albeit by, um, you know, sort of covering it with trees um, out on the site. So going through the photos from today, we're just going to go along the, the track from the, the corner of uh, Vincent Road. So you can see this is the image of the DDS site from earlier today. So you can now see, you can see where hopefully the mouse pointer is down here, the edge of that building that we saw that's the 5.5 metre high building, you can see that the landscaping is, is going a little bit above that, so sort of covering, that's the established landscaping along there, um, screening the existing buildings on the DDS demolition site from this particular viewpoint. So going along the bridleway, so this is what you're looking at for the bridleway, so you've got an access that serves a couple of properties, off uh, off the bridleway but then you're going on to a bridleway that runs along the field um, so this is a view showing the bridleway at the bottom of the image running along you can see dds demolition here in this area on the left hand side um, so you can see that when you're moving along this you can see a further angle of the site in question so the views from manston road are present but are limited to the extent that you could see um, here um, this is just standing literally just off Manston Road so there would be a further incursion into the countryside um, but the depth of the site obviously isn't really at this point the main sensitivity view is from the bridleway itself as you travel through uh, along the bridleway from well either west to east or east to west so this is the end of the DDS demolition site with the landscaping um, so we're ex extending to the right hand side of this um, you can see the edge of the Charles River site behind. Uh, there is a slight change in the land level from the bridleway, slightly slightly up, but it's a generally flat landscape. Uh, this is just showing the bridleway, just so you can see what sort of is, is, obviously a, is a well-worn route. Um, and then this image, uh, and you can see that there's a, there's a digger on top of a mound at the back of, in fact, back of the site that's proposed to be developed, so sort of around this area, um, and then expanding out. So, um, to give you an idea, this is a mast that's on the Charles River site, which is here. Uh, the development runs uh, up to the point at the edge of the end of the Charles River site along the back. So effectively, you're squaring off uh, in this area here. So um, effectively, the, the view that we were just looking at 
um, would include the incursion across here with the buildings and landscaping. Um, now, the landscape character area is the Manston Chalk Plateau, which is characterized as, as a generally flat or generally undulating landscape with extensive uh, unenclosed fields under intensive arable cultivation often. Um, and, but it does acknowledge that it's an open landscape which is fragmented by large-scale development. Obviously, you've got Manson Airport, you've got Charles River, so there are developments uh, you know, that are around there. However, it is considered by officers that this would result in harm to the countryside by virtue of removing what is a flat and open landscape from the viewpoints predominantly from the bridleway, um, even if you are screening it with landscaping. One, it's, it's obviously a long-term, a medium-term impact um, because of obviously the nature of the landscape having to take. Um, but then you are obviously moving and creating landscaping where previously there, there wasn't any. So we do feel that there is harm to the landscape character that members should consider in the balance of, of the application. And this is just a view just looking from the bridleway back towards the back of the DDS demolition site, back to the, the Manston Road. So you can again see the extent of the existing site and it would push further to the right hand side. So in terms of highways uh, impact, um, the application site, as, as mentioned earlier, includes um, car parking, which is tailored specifically for the, the needs of the individual businesses that have been put forward. Um, so it provides over the amount of car parking, as, I, as we understand from highways, required for the floor space of commercial development, but it's under the maximum parking standards. There are maximum parking standards. It is under that. Um, and um, it is acknowledged that during the course of the application, it was a concern that was raised by uh, highways about the extent of car parking. The amount of car parking has been reduced during the course of the application uh, from 338 to, to 290 spaces proposed. Now, as mentioned on a highway capacity point, um, the, the proposal is to use the existing site access. Um, the visibility you, apologies, Moses, you might not be able to actually see it, but it's a dotted line, and you can see that there's some text here. Um, has just made sure with some tracking plans provided that actually this existing access is suitable to use for the number of businesses that are going in that would be accessing via this. Um, no objection has been raised by highways on the use of this access, so this is just one image showing one way. So we're looking towards the, the north, and then this is a view uh, looking towards the south. So you can see it's a, it's a wide... Uh, Bellmouth access um, that, that provides sufficient for vehicles to um, to pass. Um, so, in terms of uh, the capacity of highways, um, there has been um, a submission that um, that has put forward for um, from highways uh, about the impact on Spitfire Junction. So, the Spitfire Junction, as members will be aware, is a junction that is at capacity. This is identified through the Thanet local plan in the modelling of all the strategic allocations and all of the modelling for the local plan. It shows that Spitfire Junction is at capacity and any increase in traffic throughput there of any substantial nature would cause further congestion and potential safety issues. Now the applicant has worked with highways looking at the scheme uh, that's shown in this image here. Um, what this proposes um, and just to come back on one point, the, uh, this has received a contribution already from the Minster Housing Site, which was secured by, by members of the, of the committee. Um, this is to propose that effectively you, you would signalise this junction uh, and you'd realign it so that you end up getting um, a... Uh, I think it's best to explain it by showing you the, the image uh, next. But if, you, if you're coming uh, down from Margate, uh, there is a left-hand turn lane that effectively runs on the existing course of the junction, uh, but with some of the, the highway uh, sort of, it's not quite verge, it's, uh, it's this area here where the road sign is. Effectively, this area would be lost, this hard surfaced area, to basically create it so that from this view, which is a, it's an elevated view from street view, so that cars effectively could move from Spitfire Way and go straight over the junction after the signalised junction is gone. So it wouldn't result in the loss of these trees, but it just results in the loss of this area here uh, with the fact that you would have to basically turn right around in the new alignment. Now, this is something that highways have been working on for a while. Um, 
and the applicant has stated a willingness to pay the required high-risk contribution towards the work. Now, to clarify the point that, that's been made earlier, um, and it, it's, it is identified in the report, um, because the recommendation, which obviously I'll come on to, is for refusal, uh, and that we don't have a legal agreement at this point in time to secure the contribution towards this, there is a technical reason for refusal, which is reason for refusal four, um, which simply sort of identifies the fact that we don't have an obligation to secure the contribution for these works. But the applicant has stated they're willing to, to pay it. So if the other issues are resolved or members feel that it's, it is an approval, this is an issue that could be dealt with via a legal agreement. Uh, in addition to that, concerns have been raised by highways uh, about the need for um, restrictions on Vincent Road uh, to do with HDV movements. There is a sign that's up on, on Vincent Road, which is a sort of an advisory sign saying no HDVs, but it's actually to get um, through a, a section uh, 278 agreement under the Highway Act, effectively a prohibition on um, HDVs using Vincent Road, because from the traffic capacity and the studies that have been done, uh, the development w could result in HDVs using Vincent Road to sort of cut across the fields, again, depending on when Spitfire Junction works take place. Again, that is an issue that would be overcome by a legal agreement. So that is, again, why that reason is a technical reason for refusal. So in terms of the sustainability of the site, um, the, sorry, let me shift over to the next page of my notes. Um, the officers have raised concerns about the sustainability of the site due to its location. Um, now, it's identified by the applicant that obviously the site um, is sort of surrounded by you know, other developments that are uh, predominantly car reliant. Um, however, officers are concerned that there is no footway linking this site with uh, the public transport links, um, the closest of which is a bus stop at Spitfire Way. Um, and obviously with um, a prohibitive distance to walk to the nearest station, which I think once built would probably be the parkway, I'd imagine, but at the moment it's, it's Margate. Um, now, it's you know understood that um, it's the applicant has submitted a travel plan, uh, and that predominantly looks to encourage cycling, car sharing, as mentioned, a, a crew bus that could pick people up, uh, a number of people up. Uh, and that travel plan includes specific targets uh, to try and um, get people to you know, car share and, uh, and, and as well as using the, the crew bus, or indeed um, increasing the number of the employees that would cycle to the site, as well as electric vehicle charging points. And those targets uh, would actually also be looked at by a coordinator that would be uh, appointed through the, the travel plan. Um, Officers, though, are concerned about the fact that this is, you know, it's a 60 mile an hour road. It is entirely um, unsafe for pedestrians to use, and therefore the development is, is totally reliant, really, on, on private vehicle. Um, and we've already mentioned the policy E13, which is a, you know, a, a policy about new development in the countryside, new business in the countryside, when it's a sustainable form of development. Um, and it, it sort of it goes hand in hand with a, a concern about the, the fact that this isn't a strategic. Um, employment development linked through the local plan which could facilitate certain requirements through for example strategic infrastructure improvements um, on balance therefore from from our side of things we do consider it's, it's an unsustainable form of development on on transportation by virtue of that lack of the footway and that reliance on private vehicle um, as well and, and it's considered that that harm should again go into the the, the balance of the application so apologies members i will wrap up this is sorry this is just a uh, a view of manston road just showing um going to the south of the site so you can see it's a 60 mile an hour road in it it's got the highway verge here but but no um, pedestrian footway um so in terms of the other matters the um report goes through um, the other considerations um including um the applicant has looked at, at noise monitoring that's been submitted to uh, the council's environmental health team uh, and environmental health think, agree with the conclusions uh, of noise monitoring. You can see just here the dots here where noise monitoring took place um, with sensitive receptors identified. You've got residential properties on Manston Road. Um, and environmental health agreed with the conclusions, but they require conditions in relation to a three metre high acoustic fence and various different restrictions on different units delivery times. I mean, the proposal generally would be operating from 6am to, to 10pm, but there would need to be restrictions on deliveries sort of 
outside of these times. Um, from archaeology purposes, uh, the desk-based assessment has been carried out and the baseline has been accepted by KCC, uh, but any approval would require a program of works with the requirement of, of likely geophysical uh, surveys and, and trial trenching as required uh, with safeguarding conditions required um, in, in that instance. In terms of ecology, uh, survey work has been carried out and there are recommendations in that survey work for enhancements. Um, that has been looked at by KCC Biodiversity. Uh, they do consider that um, with the use of the native species for planting um, that it would be acceptable, but they would require more of a detailed plan to provide uh, specific details, including um, you know, matters to do with roots for, for hedgehogs, as well as the exact planting uh, next to hedgerows to create the required roots and, and enhancement to biodiversity. Um, other matters, including uh, air quality, contamination and drainage, um, have all been looked at by consultees and are considered that with conditions would be acceptable. Uh, for drainage, and this is a, a plan just showing um, the extent of the permeable surfaces, which are in, um, in red, um, there is, uh, you know, proposed to have, um, you know, drainage basin and, and pond. Obviously, we are in an area that's quite important to ensure that surface water drainage is, is treated correctly and therefore there are uh, it would be a gramping condition requirement for a sustainable drainage scheme to be submitted which would test um, matters such as the infiltration rate that's been put forward within the drainage scheme uh, to to cover that point so um, overall um, the, the case for members is to balance the economic benefits of the development um, against the identified harms from officers uh, it is considered that in officers' view, the, the benefits are outweighed by the impact on the countryside, the loss of agricultural land, and the, the particular highway safety uh, concerns and, and location concerns. Uh, and therefore, there are four reasons for a refusal identified uh, in the application, and it's recommended to refuse by officers. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Ian. I move the officers' recommendation is adopted. Could the vice chair please second? I'll second that, chair. Thank you, Councillor Colm McCook. Members, Councillor Garner. Thank you. And thank you, um, Ian, for a very thorough presentation. Um, I do have just uh, to start with, I've got a question, really, you, about the the land that this site sits on. I mean, you've, you've, you've mentioned it's our grade one and two agricultural land. Um, you also mentioned that it is land that is owned by the applicant, I believe. Um, that's a, just the picture you've got up there, I wanted to see. Um, so this is part of a much larger piece of agricultural land. Is that all owned by the, by the applicant? Um, and also, I've just follow on from that, obviously being agricultural land, is it, is it being farmed at the moment? Will, will it is there, you know, what crops are being grown on there at the moment? Thanks. Um, I, I, the, the rest of that land that you can probably see from identified is, is within the blue line plan, so it is owned by the applicant. I, 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 can't, I can't comment on, on exactly the specifics. I must admit, I have to go away and check the, the agricultural report in terms of whether or not it's used. I mean, it's classed as through the report that was submitted. Um, agricultural agri yeah, best and most versatile agricultural land um, apologies for my ignorance I don't know if you will be able to identify uh, by virtue of that did you want to come back Councillor Garner um, not at the moment no I, I can sit I, I just wanted to understand yes it's all very well being labeled as agricultural land and I can see that it it is, but if it isn't, if it isn't being used currently as agricultural land, if the applicant is is leaving it fallow, I think that's the correct farming term. Um, I just wanted to understand that. That was all. Thank you, Councillor Hart. Thank you, Chair. I'm guessing, looking at the fields, it's either wheat or barley, one of the two, but you can't quite tell. It's too far away. Um, I've got a few things to say about this. Um, as you know, I'm not quiet most times. Um, I, I do think that we do need to have more businesses in the countryside for people to work. And to be fair to the applicant, 
a farmer could just put up buildings or sheds, if you want to call them, the size of those anyway, and there couldn't really be much that the council could do if it was farmland anyway, whether they were just for storage or whatever. So I'd like that cleared up. Um, and I do think the economic benefits to this are very good, and I do know the site to a degree, because obviously we all drive down that road occasionally, or well, if we do live in Birchington, we drive that way. Um, and it has got a good sight line. There's not many business houses really around that's going to be affected in my mind. Um, and also, you know, uh, yeah, I understand that the, the council's comment with, or the officer's comment with regards to the fact there's no pavement. There isn't a pavement. Um, there's no cycle path. There isn't a cycle path or many cycle paths in the Thanet anyway. Um, there are pavements, obviously, but then nobody wants an industrial estate in the middle of um, town. So, you know, there are always going to be objections to that. And, you know, you allow Thanet Earth to put a huge building up and people walk down a country lane that's 60 mile an hour carrying boxes of fruit. And I've seen them many a time because my garage, my car mechanic's that way. And they even have to cross over the Thanet Way the dual carriage part, just to get a bus to get home. So I, I think the argument is there's no pavements is a, is a, a nonsense, really, um, with regards to what, what you want to do. And I just think we've, we've got to be educated about this because we, we, we are keeping a, keep agree, agreeing that we're going to allow houses um, to be built on land. But people have got to have a job to go to to have a house or somewhere to live. And if you haven't got the jobs, then we can't have the houses. And to be fair to the council, or unfair to the council, I think, um, you put a very negative sp uh, spin on this application compared to if it was houses that you want to be built on that area. And I think that was a, a, a very disjustice to the applicant, really, because I, th I think it was a very negative proposal. Uh, and I think that we should be looking at these in a positive attitude. Um, OK, we're going to lose a bit of agricultural land and I would assume that the person who owns the land will actually reap the crop or take the crop in before they actually destroy it. Um, but I, I, I just think we've got to be a little bit more sensible about all this stuff and, and to refuse I think is just totally wrong. Thank you Chair. Uh, thank you Councillor Hart. I'm going to bring Ian back on a comment you made there. It's just to come back on the, the farm PD point, um, yet there are provisions when agricultural holdings are a certain size that allow for buildings to be built. So in terms of that particular point, then technically there is the ability to ha have buildings of a certain scale, which could result in a landscape visual impact in, in, in itself. Um, so that is something that, that you know, that, that's to consider. I mean, I do think that, you know, we're, we're obviously not looking at a proposal for housing, but I would, I would argue that um, the sustainability of the location is something that is considered when it comes to um, residential development and obviously members more recently have been looking at applications where actually the sites have been allocated for residential development in the local plan uh, and when they're not allocated one of the main um, types of applications that come forward are ones on the edge of the urban confines now obviously um, whilst there is sporadic development around here this is, is is nowhere near the urban confines and the aim obviously of housing development is to try and make it as sustainable as possible by putting it as close as possible to transport links you know and, and next to the urban confines if the landscape visual impact is acceptable on the countryside and obviously that's why you know we've raised a concern in this instance um, and uh, you know I, I I accept your point that you concerned that it's it we're not sort of putting forward the benefits in a stronger way but i think we have identified that there are obviously economic developments uh, sorry economic benefits that members should consider but the officer view is that they're outweighed by the harm thank you chair uh yes i'll, I'll let you come back councillor hart thank you chair thank you and it's a very fair comment um f uh, return to that and i mean to be you as we all know we've all used the spitfire junction if if this applicant is prepared to sort that out then thank God for them, because it is the most, you know, I've had my car smacked there, it's the most dangerous junction turning right out of there. And we've all agreed the um, other end of the road, of Manston Road, to be done for houses. And that is all going to be sorted out as well. So all the junctions down that end are going to be sorted as well. So it, it's going to be a nice place to have a, a, a commercial development, realistically. And it is the perfect spot, I think, personally. Uh, thank you. Councillor Rozeski. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, can I get a clarification, please, um, Ian, from yourself? Um, you said that uh, OFP, for example, are in the district. Uh, 
last time I looked, OFP are in Sandwich, which I believe is in Dover District. Can you confirm that, please? Um, I would need... Can I come back to you on that? Just to confirm, If it's the case that they're not in the district, then technically I can clarify the number of jobs that would technically be in the district by virtue of this proposal, but I will just double-check that, if that's OK. OK. Just... just just to carry on then, uh, okay. Chair, thank Thanks. you. I agree with Councillor Hart on, on his highways um, comments and, 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 yeah, basically people who are going to that sort of uh, industry and that go in a car or a van, uh, minibus, wh whatever, but they, they very rarely walk to these places. Um, I've never seen it, but uh, uh, most industrial units that are outside town, people have uh, arrangements to get there, and it's usually by vehicle, so I'm not really worried about the highways. Um, if I'm correct in what I'm saying about the OFP, for example, which I believe is in Sandwich, uh, it is, is outside our district, in which case it will be bringing uh, nearly 200 jobs to the area and not 20. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm going to bring back Ian on what you've brought up there. Thank you. Yes, I can. Yeah, I can confirm you're quite right, Councillor Rezeki. It's um, that they're based on two sites at the moment outside the district. Uh, so just to confirm, that's site one, where it states that 75 people are currently employed there in, in 2020, with 20 additional. So technically, then that's, I suppose, on those figures, that's 95 jobs coming into the district, uh, with the others being the retained jobs, uh, as stated. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Alban. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh. You Councillor Alban? Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Just a moment, Councillor Wing. I can dress up. Sorry. Um, you don't need to. No. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the way that this discussion is going, I think we're all, some of us are, are like minded in relation to this development, um, having given due con consideration to, to, the, to the long proposal that, that Ian has put, put forward. Um, of course, his, uh, his talk about the, the application, the ap the applica because he's refused it, he would, um, it, it would be in a negative, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, but um, I, I think, you know, it, the... No industrial unit is pretty. Uh, it doesn't, where, doesn't matter where it's located. Um, there's plenty of other ag agricultural grade one or two agricultural land attached to this proposed development. We definitely need the jobs, and I, I, I do go along with uh, Councillor Hart's view in, in relation to uh, the junction, because we all know that that needs to be done, and if they're going to pay for it, then 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 great. Um, I would just I would just make a point in reading some of the consultations, one of which Ian hasn't mentioned, um, which was from Nat Natural England, um, of which they have no objection based on the plans submitted. Natural England considered that the proposed development will not have significant adverse impacts on the statutory protected nature conservation sites. I, th I mean, I think that was that's a big issue with that. So um, for me, Chair, I, I, I can't go along with the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Crinton. Haven't forgotten you, Councillor Wing. You, you get there. <laughs> thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions, really. Uh, one is to do with some reassurance that the parking level um, will be adequate because, as has already been indicated, um, it's unlikely that people are going to be walking to this site. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to remember what, what was I've seen already, but uh, I did hear that the parking had been reduced um, and whether or not there's alternative... Uh, is it just cars or are there other forms of transport that are deemed likely to be used. I don't know what the existing um, staffing are using. And the other, my second um, thought is that we're covering open land with buildings and concrete. Um, what provision is there and what thought has been given to um, rainwater drainage um, because of the loss of, of that um, by putting concrete down? 
Yeah, oh, it might be in the report, but I, I can't remember it. Um, so to just come back in terms of car parking, so the amount of car parking that, that it's been reduced to is considered to be appropriate for the number, so for the sort of the way that highways calculate is, is often on the floor space creates a certain number of employees, but also the applicant has submitted information about the pr sort of general number of employees that this, this results in, um, and therefore the, the level of parking is considered to be um, sufficient for what's being proposed. Um, in terms of provision for other uh, vehicles, as I mentioned, there are a, a substantial amount of cycle parking with the travel plan submitted by the applicant uh, aiming to try and increase the amount of, of cycling uh, with a target of, of somewhere increasing the amount of cycling by 3%. There is some information that's been provided by the applicant which looked at the units of one, the OFP um, and uh, all access in terms of uh, the percentage of um, how people uh, actually got to their existing site um, and predominantly that was via car sort of 76 percent sorry 72 percent of of fit unit one's workers um and 50 percent um well and 100 percent in fact for for unit three which is the uh, all access site that's in hearts down i'm going to just say hearts down look at councillor rosecki and hope he doesn't correct me uh, there uh, for all access um the the tram the travel plan is is key though and i think obviously i can understand that members are you know, are moving to to a point of of considering this to be acceptable because the travel plan is only as good as the monitoring that occurs to ensure it's actually occurring, and it's something that um, would certainly need to be an obligation within the 106 agreement to have a contribution towards the highways uh, officer to, that looks at all the travel plans and actually monitors actually what they're doing on it, whether or not they're actually according with their travel plans to try and increase. Um, as much as possible other modes of transportation but obviously officers concern is that none of that will involve walking to the site at all uh, and therefore none of it's going to link to the existing bus network either so you are limited in terms of where your gains will come in terms of um, employees coming to this site uh, oh and drainage um, surface so if I just quickly pop back to the image that I showed at the end um, in terms of Sorry. Um, in terms of the, the drainage scheme, so what we have is a sort of strategy with a plan that shows that um, that, that it's likely that, that drainage can be dealt with in terms of rainwater on the site through uh, infiltration uh, via sort of basins and storage underneath the permeable paving. However, we do need more detail. So that's why um, uh, the Kent as the KCC is the lead uh, highway, sorry, the local lead flood authority um, have required a Grampian condition, which would require a very detailed drainage scheme to come in. Predominantly, that's about the infiltration rate and how much it can actually drain into the various sources. So, um, but we don't consider it to be a, a problem. There will be a technical solution to overcome, so it wouldn't form a reason for refusal on that basis. Thank you, and Councillor Wing. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I don't think any of us is really comfortable about building on our farmland, our, our very rich farmland. So we, we, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. But I do find it quite strange, and I agree with Councillor Hart, that we sit here, it seems month after month, approving big, big residential builds on agricultural land. And now we've got a commercial build that, that, that we're being asked to refuse. I do know the road quite well because I use the, the boarding house and it is a bad road. It, there's no, no question it's a bad road. But I also knew the, know the DDS site quite well and it, it's a very tidy and a very clean site. So I, I think if, if the developers are going to uh, base their standards on the DDS site, then, then I think it will probably be a good development. I have noted that Southern Water have concerns over possible pollution. And again, I will quote the, the ex-CEO of Southern Water saying we're very water stretched in this area so it's good to see that southern water have put in a, a range of things that have to be done and also following on kcc obviously want more information relating to drainage 
So I, I, I think I'm of a mind to support this application on the understanding that the developer honours everything in it, that, that, that is in the plan and, and looks to, to make this as high a quality development as possible. Going back to walking to the site, being able to walk to the site, I, I've yet to find a direct walk to Parkway Station from the far end of Ramsgate. So we approved that without actually considering whether anybody could walk or cycle there directly and they can't. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Ring. Councillor Paver. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, I disagree that the um, report was negative. To be honest, I had to look back to check the recommendation. I think it was very fair. I think we were, we were able to see both aspects of um, you know, the, 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 harm, the, possible, the possible harm and the benefits. But um, I do feel that, the, in this case, the economic benefits do outweigh harm to the countryside. Um, I think our local area, for our local area to thrive, we need to accommodate businesses and to provide employment. Um, it is a fragmented landscape. I particularly um, approve of the landscape, the landscape buffer that's being supplied. Um, and as other members have said the improvement to the Spitfire Junction, if it's uh, agreed, I think would be excellent. So, um, and also the implementation of the travel plan. So, I, I, I feel that I would like to support this application. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bayford. Councillor Hart, take come Just back. Just a quick one, Chair. Um, can we say to the applicant, if they wish, and can we agree it as well, that if they want to put solar panels on the roof to, to get some natural electricity, it doesn't have to come back to planning, um, because obviously it's a big area which is covered, and that would be quite nice if they could actually do that. We can't force them, obviously, but bring it back to planning if they want to do that. It would be a bit silly, really. Are going to come back, uh, um, There Hart. are permitted development rights for certain commercial premises to have solar panels. I believe one of them may actually propose solar panels within their proposal, so your wish is granted. Councillor Garner. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, come to the defence of the officer's recommendation on this one. Um, one of my main concern on, on this, with this application, like on a lot of others, whether it's land designated in the local plan or isn't land designated in the local plan, is the continual loss of prime agricultural land in Thanet. And we're, we're, losing, we're losing too much. And with the current world situation, we know we're going to need to hold on to as much as we can, and we can, know we're going to need to grow our own in this country. And we can't rely on imports of, of um, agricultural produce. So I do think we, we need to consider that a lot more carefully. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Garner, and take your point there. Thank you, members. I think you've had a good report and um, I think a fair debate as well. Uh, so I have to put this to you, which is um, the motion is for the officer's recommendation, which is to refuse this application. Can I have a show of hands who are in favour of refusal? One, two. Those against? Abstentions? Right, that motion has been lost. So if you could bear with me one moment, please. I will come back straight to Mr. Livingston. Um, so it's obviously been very clear, members' view on this uh, application. Um, there are particular though, requirements for approving this development. Um, primarily, this relates to a lot of the consultee comments that have come in, which have requested various safeguarding conditions. Um, obviously, I've understood that the main driver for uh, the outweighing process of the various identified harms is about the economic benefits. And so um, my recommendation to you now following the debate would be, um, obviously, if a member was to move a motion that would approve the application um, as the application by virtue of the economic benefits uh, from the proposal and the application, applicant's submission outweighs the identified harm subject to appropriate safeguarding conditions and the receipt of a legal agreement securing contributions towards off-site highway improvements um, at Spitfire Junction, Vincent Road and travel plan monitoring 
Uh, and usually we would require that within six months. So that's to try and make sure no one's dragging their heels on any side of things. Um, and if it did go over six months, we'd have to bring it back to members. Uh, thank you for that, Ian. Well, you've heard what Ian said there. Uh, I'd like a proposer. Yeah, I'll propose that. Uh, uh, Councillor Hart, I believe, put his hand up first. Uh, I won't go into arguments. Uh, and I won't ask you to repeat what Mr Livingston said, because I know you won't be able to remember it, nor can I. Um, seconded by Councillor Ozeski. You've heard the new motion. Those in favour? Anybody against? Abstentions? That has been carried. Thank you, members. Thank you. I'll just let members leave. Okay, members, moving on to agenda item 5B, an application for deferral of the former British gas site on North Elm Road in Broadstairs. Now, I have a a note here which I would like you to listen to, please. Uh, if you would note that Ms. Culligan, which, who is the Director of Law and D Democracy of Thanet Council, has requested that for the purposes of transparency, it be noted that Mr. Goddard, who is speaking on this application as a local planning consultant, is her husband. This has been recorded as an officer register of interest which i think is very fair and thank you for that uh speaking in favor of the application um mr goddard please you have three minutes thank you chair thank you members uh, the applicants have a very long history in saint peter's they denoted land for the cemetery and for mockets wood and a village green they also enabled the co-op the health center and retirement housing to be built at hopeville avenue with this application scheme, they continue that legacy by including much needed and policy compliant 30% affordable housing, more than two acres of compensatory land to deliver biodiversity net gain, around a hundred, sorry, I'm exaggerating, around one million of section 106 contributions and the costly additional remediation of this contaminated site. The site has a lawful use for commercial storage, and that's a use which would generate substantial heavy goods vehicle movements, which would be um, damaging to the highway network and would be unsightly. The site was previously allocated in the draft local plan for housing. All the proposed housing would be within the identified built confines in the local plan, and none is within the green wedge or on agricultural land. The land has already been partially decontaminated for its use as commercial storage, and it will be further decontaminated to a condition which is suitable for housing. All the trees identified by the council's tree officer as important have been retained. Additional trees will be planted, and a five meter landscape buffer outside domestic gardens will be created around the edge of the built development. Beyond this is a 2.2 acre area of undeveloped compensatory land which will contain ponds and low level planting to attract wildlife and enhance biodiversity. Some objectors have said that this is cramped development. However, your local plan applies a notional density of 12 dwellings per acre and this scheme is 11 per acre and incorporates a play area and a spacious layout. The scheme before you has been subject to extensive consideration by your officers and all the statutory consultees, including Kent Highways. None object to the grant of planning permission. Overall, the proposers comply with national and local policies by taking a contaminated brownfield site within the built confines in a sustainable location with a lawful use for commercial storage, further remediating the land and provided much needed housing, 30% of which would be affordable. And in addition, we're providing a full set of these section 106 contributions amount, amounting to around one million pounds. 
The application is fully supported by your officers, and I ask members of this planning committee to share your officers' conclusions that this proposal has significant benefits which outweigh any extremely limited environmental harm. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Goddard. Uh, speaking uh, with an objection is Miss Sutton. If you're there, please. You have three minutes. Thank you. Well, I'm the chair of Friends of Mockets Wood, which is a community woodland adjacent to the gas works mentioned in this planning application, managed by Broadstairs, St. Peter's Town Council, and by local volunteers. I attended the last appeal hearing where this was refused. I wish to object to the above application on many grounds. It's likely to lead to erosion of our much needed green wedge, and it's not designated to propose housing in the neighborhood plan at present. Overbuilding, specifically in St. Peter's, where the, these gas works are located, there's a small hump bridge over a railway line next to the site. The bridge can only take one car either way and has a separate small lane for pedestrians. Parts of St. Peter's lie within the conservation area, which is already congested. Along Vicarage Street, there are two areas, which are only one way, and with calming, traffic calming. Some of the pavements are only wide enough to allow one pedestrian. The planned housing will only add much more congestion and lead, if not to a complete shutdown, frequent gridlock. It is likely that people will want to go through St. Peter's to Broadstairs or Westwood Cross for their shopping or to the beach. The B2053 is also congested and subject to traffic calming. Previous applications to build on the farmland between the gas works, Mocketswood and the A255, have been rejected on appeal by central government. But I worry that this, if this planning application is granted, it may lead to a resuscitation of the previous applications in the future. At the appeal decision regarding the previous planning application, that I can give you the number, but any, the inspector wrote in section 18 that he had heard that the site, that is the gas works, had been remediated to a level so that it can be used for storage. In this respect, the evidence before me suggests that the site has a realistic existing use for storage which a landowner could implement. And moreover, later on in the appeal, he says in section 21, that the appeal proposal would be contrary to the aims of policy CC5 and that there is a lack of essential need for the development to be located there. I do not find that there is an overriding need to locate housing in this part of the countryside at the current time. So as per permission was not granted at the appeal for the adjacent field to be developed, the appellant's argument then that the development of the gas works would only be viable if the permission for the adjacent field was granted makes a nonsense of this planning application. At present, the gas works cannot be built on for residential application with uh, development without vast sums of money being spent to further decontaminate. Thus, to recoup these sums of money and make a profit, the proposed development would need to build houses too expensive to be considered for social housing, or they would need to be crammed in. There are insufficient amenities, let alone water in Thanet, to cater for the already high number of housing developments in the area. And if this application goes ahead, it will increase footfall through Mockett's Wood, threaten its very existence um, as the footpaths through it act as shortcuts away from the congestion. The wood itself is home to many birds, species, trees and other plants and fungi and is an important popular local amenity. The appellant should apply for government funding to rewild plant trees and thus improve the biodiversity and create a green corridor for nature. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sutton. Uh, I'll now ask the planning officer to outline the report, which I think is Emma. Thank you, Chairman. This is the application site outlined in red here. So on the right-hand side of the screen is North Down Road. Um, you can see the railway running along the northeastern side of the site and to the west of the site and south of the site is open countryside. This is an aerial view of the site. So the site boundary um, of the um, housing development um, runs along this um, line here. So you can see a, there's an existing line of trees that run along the boundary of the site. Again, you can see the um, railway to the north and above that is um, an employment site with commercial units. To the east of the site you can see our existing residential properties at Front North Down Road and to the right hand side here you can see is Mockettswood. 
So this is a further view, uh, aerial view looking towards the application site. So again, the application site runs along this boundary here. And then a further view again, looking towards the application site, which is, which is in this location here. So this, all of this area here is um, open country, countryside and green wedge. And then this is just looking from um, North Down Road towards the site. So you can see the application site again is here. So you can see within the site it is previously developed land. So there's quite a few areas of hard surfacing within the site. Um, the photos I show you later will actually be more in this area here because we can easily get access into this space. But there's a substation in this location um, and lots of fencing within this location as well. And then again, a further view looking at towards the site and um, it's in, in the context of the countryside. So um, the photos I'm now going to show you will um, start at this point here within North Down Road, looking towards the access, will go into the site and then I'll show you around the boundaries boundary of the site. So this is the existing access into the site from North Down Road. So the bridge is off to the right hand side and you can see residential properties on the left hand side here. Then as you go into the site, you can see the, the hard surface in the road leading into the site. And then on the right hand side here is the existing substation with um, palisade fencing around it. And again here you can see the um, substation. And now this is inside the site. Um, so this is now looking towards the southern boundary. And then moving along, you can see the existing trees along the site. So one of the concerns raised was loss of trees. None of these trees are protected. I've been on site with the tree officer. We've had a look at the trees. None of the trees are considered to be worthy of a tree, protect, uh, tree, tree preservation order. Um, but you'll see later on that we are seeking to retain these trees as um, a screen along the boundary. So again, this is now looking towards the further towards the west of the site. You can see again the existing trees along here. And... That's the far west of the site. So the railway is off to the right hand side here. And this is the commercial development. And then now looking towards the north with again the railway behind. So this is probably one of the best trees on the site. Um, and then this is now looking further to the east. So again, all these trees along the boundary here, the majority of these are being retained. So the only trees really looking to be removed are in the location of um, the access. And then this is again standing in the center of the site looking off to the east. So this is now back in North Down Road. Um, this is the existing um, bridge that runs over the railway. Um, you can see it's quite narrow and there are currently um, some um, concerns with lack of visibility as you go across the bridge. And this is standing on the bridge looking towards the application site, which is on the left hand side. So these were the, um, the trees that you could see from within the site along the boundary. So some of these are actually on the highway, on the railway verge. And then there's some additional trees on the other side of this actually within the application site. This is within North Down Road, so just so you can see the, the um, general character of the area. So there's a range of style of um, dwellings within the area. There's, as you can see, terrace units and detached units, mainly on this side of the road. On the right-hand side is um, mainly a row of semi-detached units, all of them are two-storey in height. This is now um, from towards the uh, east of the site, looking towards the site. So the application site is this location here. So this is the um, existing boundary of the site with the row of trees. And then again, just so you see, this is the boundary running here and then it tucks in here. And then again, this is the corner of the application site. And this is the um, neighboring properties that are to the east of the site. So this was the original plan that was submitted as part of the application. This was for 60 units. It's in outline form. The proposal is um, considering the access into the site and the proposed layout. Um, you can see that there was a, um, a, a range of unit types within um, the development. So you can see there's a, a mix of terraced and, and semi-detached units. You can see the location of the play area, which was in this far northern corner. Um, along the boundary, these trees um, were looking to be retained but you can see that the trees were located within the gardens of the properties so there was concern that if this was to um, be allowed that in the future because they're not protected there would be the potential for these trees to be felled um, there was concern as well that in terms of the views of the, into the site from the green wedge that in terms of the, the layout that was proposed it was quite um, sort of a, a, a heavy form of development with limited spaces between the units so from the views that you would see into the site it would appear quite overdeveloped potentially um, so we did look to amend this to turn the units round um, and to relocate the play area and to improve tree planting so this is now the current proposal that's before members tonight so you can see here these are the units on the western side 
They've been reorientated so that there's lots of space in between the units, which will allow for um, views through between the between the buildings. The play space has been relocated into this far southern corner, which is um, improves access into the site and would actually improve um, the the access to the surrounding community. Um, in terms of the tree screening, the um, trees along here, so the green trees are the retained existing trees, and then the black outlines are the proposed trees so we're actually looking to create a buffer strip along here that would be which would fall outside any of the curtilages of the properties and there's a condition that would seek to retain this as a buffer strip as part of future reserve matters application and long term as an amenity strip which would allow for the trees to be retained into the future even though they do not have the preservation order on them um, you can see that buffer strip extends right down along the the, the boundary of the site right to the far southern corner and actually extends around the play space as well. So we'll actually create quite um, a softening of the boundary into the site. This area on the left hand side here is um, what, what's um, annotated on the plan as the compensatory land. So this area that's um, hashed is actually within the green wedge. So the green wedge boundary um, is this line here. So the site itself is actually within the urban confines, but this area here on the left-hand side is in the green wedge. This um, area of land is proposed for low-level planting and for the drainage to serve the development. Um, so the reason for this is that within the site itself, there's quite a high level of contamination. Um, whilst that currently has been remediated to um, serve the open storage use of the site, it needs further remediation for the proposed residential use. And because of the contamination of the site, there's concerns that um, there's not, it's not possible to have um, a, a sustainable urban drainage system within the site. And they're actually, this actually needs to be off site where there's no contamination. And investigation works have taken place that have shown that there's limited contamination in this area here. And so um, KCC SUDS have agreed that this is an appropriate solution for the drainage. So whilst this, the use of this land will result in some loss of open countryside, in terms of the impact on the green wedge and the landscape character area, it will still remain open in appearance with the low level planting. So there won't be any tree planting within the site. The tree planting is solely along the actual boundary of the site and this will remain as open space. So the actual use of this land for um, the planting and the um, attenuation pond will actually have limited impact on the green wedge and landscape character area. So just to show you again in the context in terms of the aerial, this again is the um, existing boundary of the site. This area here would be the area of, of um, agricultural land that would be used for drainage and for um, the uh, low level planting. At this point, I'll just give you a bit of history on the site and what happened with the previous application. So a previous application was submitted, which included this area of land here, this open countryside site here, which is, did fall within the green wedge. We refused this application on the impact it had on the green wedge because of long um, views into the, the space, the lofts of openness. Um, and this was re uh, went to appeal, we won this at appeal. So the, the reason for that piece of land being used as part of the development um, was argued by the agent as being that this piece of land was needed in order to make the whole site viable. At this point in time, this site was allocated in the draft local plan for housing. So we were looking for that site to come forward for housing, but we were advised by the agent that it could only be viable if this area of land was also developed as part of a scheme. Obviously, we didn't, did not consider that to be um, acceptable, which is why it was refused. And following the appeal decision, this area of land, um, the application site, has been taken out as a housing allocation, so it's now no longer allocated within the Thanet local plan. So it has a lawful um, open storage use. It previously historically was formed part of the um, employment site, but now it doesn't have an allocation, but it does have um, a, an established open storage use. So through this application, the difference between them is that this has now come forward. The reason that this has come forward on its own, just the application, just this part of the site itself we've been advised by the applicant is that further information on the contamination has come forward they have found that the actual remediation costs for developers in the site are much lower than they had previously um, expected them to be and now this site can come forward on its own for housing development without the need for any housing development within the green wedge so this proposal does not consider any housing within the green wedge it's solely within the urban confines on previously developed land So in terms of the other issues, um, impact on neighbours, 
the nearest neighbouring property is this property here, which is number 70 to 78 um, North Down Road. Um, in terms of the distance from the nearest neighbouring property, or the nearest proposed dwelling to their garden is around 19 metres. Um, through a future reserve matters application, we can consider the window locations within that property and make sure there's, any, there's no significant impact on their privacy. In terms of noise and disturbance, the um, existing road into the site is actually in this location here and they're actually relocating the road so it's further away from the neighbouring property. Um, the the neighbour did raise some concerns but but really just with the um, boundary treatment they have and the um, impact from it on, the, on their property because of the limited boundary treatment they had so there is a condition proposed that recommends the erection of a new two metre high fence along the boundary and it's considered that given the distance to the road um, and the fact that, it, again, it has a established lawful use as open storage and therefore you could have HGV vehicles using that access now that the impact from the development would have limited impact on, on their um, amenity. In terms of the future occupiers of the development, they are it's located next to the railway, so there has been some noise assessments carried out. Um, there's some mitigation measures that will be necessary when constructing the units um, in order to protect the amenity of these units from the noise from the railway. In terms of the um, scale of units, so the scale and design is not being considered at this stage, but you can see within, with, um, on this plan they're actually showing an illustrative um, scale of the units. So they all would be proposed as two-storey, so there's nothing exceeding two-storey in height. Um, in terms of the open space, as previously mentioned, this is now located in this area here. This would include an equipped play area as well as general open space um, to serve the development. The size of the open space complies with the requirements within um, policy GI04, and therefore the, the uh, provision of that space is considered to be appropriate. In terms of affordable housing, the original application proposed only 26% affordable housing um, on the grounds that there, it was unviable to provide anything further. Um, the agent has reconsidered this, and in order to try and um, achieve the 30% provision in order to make it a policy compliance scheme, the number of units have increased during the application. So the original application came in for 60, and this is now for 65 units, um, which has allowed the um, agents to now offer 30% affordable housing on site. Um, whilst we would normally look at a 70-30 split, a 50-50 split is being offered, so 50% of shared ownership and 50% affordable rent, which our housing team have considered and, and consider acceptable as they are getting 30% on site, they're, they're happy to consider that split on viability grounds. In terms of the actual mix of units, there's a, um, a range of mix. So there's a one bed, two bed, and three bed, and four bed units on the site. So again, when, when increasing the number of units from 60 to 65, the reason that this has had limited impact on, on the character of the area is that some flat blocks have been introduced. So the original scheme was solely for houses. There's now two flat blocks, one in this location here, and one in this location here, which provides the one bed units, which we have a great need for in terms of the affordable units. This means that whilst the number of units has increased in terms of the actual built form, there's actually been a limited increase in the number of, um, of buildings across the site. So the actual impact from that increase of units has had limited impact on the character of the area. So in terms of considering the impact on um, highways, this is um, an aerial view just showing, again, the current access into the site. So this is a current access in this location here from North Down Road. You can see the bridge that goes across the railway. So the proposal is looking to relocate the access into this location here, which will allow for improved visibility into the site. And it will allow um, them to achieve uh, 2.4 by 40 metre visibility displays. As part of the scheme, they're also looking to widen the road um, in this location here, which will improve visibility of vehicles coming over the bridge. So the road widening will go from 4.9 metres, which is the current width, to 6.8 metres in this location here. Um, they're also looking to propose uh, crossing points. So in this location here would be crossing points and then across the actual access itself. So this is the highway plan um, proposed. So you can see um, the crossing points in this location here and in this location here, this is the existing access into the site. This is now the proposed access with the um, visibility. Um, and I'll just show you this, which is a, 
slightly more detailed. So the existing line of the road is this grey um, dotted line here, and this is now um, the width of the road here. So you can see the, the fact it's widened from this point here over to here in order to improve that visibility to so get a direct line of traffic crossing the bridge um, as you approach the bridge. There's also a localised build out in this location here, which also will help with visibility. So KTC Highways have um, been consulted on the application. They've advised that when considering the existing open storage use in relation to the proposed housing development, there will be an, incre an increase in vehicle movements into in the local area. Um, the increase will be 2.8% on net flows in North Down Road and 1.37% in Vicarage Street. They consider that this increase is not, will not result in severe impact on the highway network, um, and it's only a severe impact that could allow us to refuse an application on, on highway grounds. Um, the uh, sorry, in terms of the uh, vehicle movements during the day, so currently there's 10 to 15 vehicle movements during the ne the network peak. So this is increasing to 17 to 22 during the morning and 10 to 15 during the evening. But again, as, as mentioned, this will not result, not considered a result of severe impact on the highway network because as you come out onto North Down Road, whilst there's some um, concerns with Vicarage Street, the, the traffic would spread. Some will go um, across to Beacon Road um, and some will come down North Down Road and then it will spread out. So the actual percentage increase in Vicarage Street where there are concerns is, is considered to be limited. So the other consideration was the impact on um, pedestrian movement. So there's currently an existing bridleway that runs along this boundary here. Um, with the development of this site, it's quite likely there would be increased um, need to um, for pedestrians to access this area here where you have the, the Mockettswood surgery, um, you've got the church, you've got the co-op. So um, pedestrian movement to this area was considered by um, KCC Public Rights Away um, team. They have um, requested the resurfacing of um, Bridalway, and um, we've managed to secure a contribution of £12,000, which would um, resurface this part of Bridalway here up to the point where the um, path goes through Mocket Wood. So this is the existing Bridalway that leads on to North Down Road. So you can say it's currently an unmade path. And this is the um, access that goes through um, Mockett's wood that leads to the surgery so the this area here would be resurfaced um, in order to improve um, the, the usability of that space for the increased pedestrians from the development so all contributions of, um, that have been requested are being secured through um, a legal agreement so we've, we haven't yet received the draft agreement which is why it's delegated for approval subject to that the agreement coming in um, the site is considered to to be a sustainable site it's in close proximity of st peter's village you can easily walk into the village where there are um, the facilities and services it's previously developed land within the urban confines with the only part of the development um, that was within the green wedge being developed is this area here which is the low level planting and um, which offers the biodiversity benefits and therefore whilst there will be a loss of some agricultural land the benefits to biodiversity are considered to outweigh that loss this area these are areas are all protected by by condition so it's not expected like through the reserve matters um application no development could come forward in this land because we are actually approved with layout through this application so nothing more can come forward as part of the reserve matter scheme so if members were concerned that there could be encroachment into the green wedge that isn't possible through this application because this is um, would be approving this layout as it is not anything further and obviously if in the future they look to come in with any housing within the green wedge that would be a separate application to be considered and we will again consider that through the policy but in terms of this actual application, the impact on the green wedge and landscape character area is considered to be acceptable given the fact that there is retention of the tree screen along the boundary and um, the provision of that as a retained buffer and then um, enhancements through the new planting of trees along that boundary which will help to soften the development. Um, the remediation of the contamination is considered to be a benefit along with those biodiversity improvements and whilst there is an increase in vehicle movements, these are considered to be uh, minimal. 
the 30% affordable housing is achieved along with the contributions and therefore is considered overall to be a sustainable form of development that will contribute to the council's housing supply and therefore it is recommended that it be deferred and delegated for approval subject to the legal agreement and safeguarding conditions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. I move the officer's recommendation be adopted. Could the vice chair please second? I'll second that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Common Cook. Councillor Garner. Thank you. Thank you for um, thank you for the thorough presentation as well. Um, I have. I mean, I, I called this in because I do have a number of concerns about this this proposed um, development, and I'll just go through a couple of them to start with. Anyway. Um, not in ne necessarily in priority order. Um, I am, I have to say, I'm extremely surprised about the um, KCC statements about the roads. I'm, I mean, I'm obviously very familiar with those roads, very familiar with Vicarage Road, Church Street, and with that um, North Dunn Road over that bridge. At this, at the moment. It is a uh, chocker block. That is a one at one end of North Down Road. That that one way bridge is a bit of a nightmare for local residents and for people who use it as a bit of a cut through, coming from Margate, going to taking their kids to the school. Um, and in at the other end, Vicarage Road, Church Street, that is points one end one way as well as was mentioned by Camille. That's already a dan two dangerous um, problem roads. This is adding. Well, I didn't quite follow the how the, the there's just a two percent increase because if you look at the with 65 properties, and even with one one car in each house, that's going to add significant volume, and it's also going to add significant issues at the turn in and out of that. Um, housing estate from North Down Road and despite that widening of the road there I still think that will be an, an issue um, and I think if people if members aren't aware of that and I suspect a lot are I would I would advise them to maybe go and have a have a look uh, before considering approving this um, my other one of my other main issues around this is around this site being on the edge of the green wedge so to speak um you you gave a bit of the history about previous applications um and needing a wider development on some of the countryside to enable the contamination of the site to be cleared and now we we find that um now it is viable without those extra houses because the contamination of the site um, can be dealt with for less money. I mean, I am concerned about that camp contamination. As, as you've said, it is an old um, British gas works, um, going back to pre-natural gas when, when gas was create, created from, um, produced from coal. I mean, I know the site is uh, capped with concrete, and I don't, I haven't read anywhere that there is, but there's a clear understanding of exactly what the con contamination below is. Although I do understand and believe that it's currently vented a couple of points um, into a couple of the farmer's fields. So what is that, what that release is from that contamination, I'm not sure. So I can't, I would like to understand more about how we can now be sure this land can be decon decontaminated for a lot less than what it was previously. But uh, get back to the green wedge. That that is a that there is a long strip of land, well, a lot more of the land. But there is a strip of land that I know that the Mocket Trust owned all the way across the back of Mocket's Wood, um, the back of the churchyard, all the way along to um, what uh, the St Peter's Road. Um, and any further development, I wouldn't like to see any any approval of this be seen as a sort of a green light or go ahead 
for any further um, incursion into the green wedge being allowed to maybe help pay for the contamination uh, or the decontamination of this this site so I do I would I mean obviously open to hear what others have got to say about that and one my, minor point you did talk about um, the uh, bridle way that was being upgraded to give more access to footway through Mocket Wood. I mean, I do know, familiar with Mocket Wood, there's quite, quite a lot of pedestrian footfall through there that has caused some damage to that wood, which, as was mentioned, a, quite a large group of volunteers work very hard to upkeep, and I do have a concern about that footfall being um, significantly increased. Although I suppose if that's done on the same way as um, KCC percentage increases, that would be a just a 2% increase in footfall that we don't need to worry about. But um, yeah, I'm interested to hear what others have got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Garner. Councillor Hart. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have some concerns about this because I... Uh, along with my esteemed councillor, Councillor Garner. I, I know this area reasonably well. And um, it beggars belief that they want to move the the exit or entrance to this site even closer to a bridge, which you come over at um, any speed, you can't see what's the other side. Now, I, th I think that's an absolutely frightening and, and shocking revelation. Um, but I'd like to know what the contamination of this site is. What is it, heavy metals, or what is it? I just want to know exactly what it is. It methane gas, whatever's given off, I want to know what that is. And I want to know um, that this green wedge, which looks very pretty on the left-hand side of this picture, um, it's got water ponds in it and all low-level vegetation, which is marvellous. Who's going to maintain it? Um, how dangerous is that for the young, younger generation, i.e. kids are kids, if there's a puddle there, they go and splash in it. Can they get to it? Is it accessible to the public? Um, or is it being um, just left to be wilded? Um, and um, It is good that we're using or looking at using brownfield sites. That's wonderful. Everybody applauds that and everybody wants to. Right? The bridge does concern me majorly and, but I also want to know what all the contaminants are and how they're going to deal with it and how they're going to make that site safe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hart. Bring back Emma. If you... I'm afraid I don't know what the actual contamination elements are that are within the site, but in terms of the actual contamination side of things, um, I know that they submitted... Um, initially um, a document that looked at the contamination and I know that we've obviously consulted with the Environment Agency and they raised concerns that not enough information had been provided on what mit mitigation was going to be carried out what for um, in terms of the remediation. So a further report um, was submitted, so a land contamination planning support statement which provided a clear outline of the remediation works that were proposed. So that is set out within the report, so they're basically th the summary of this was there was excavation of hot spots of contamination, the installation of 800 millimetres of a capping layer within gardens and 300 millimetres millimeters within landscaped areas, the installation of vapour membranes within buildings with this passive underfloor ventilation, um, and the use of um, protective line barrier pipe work. So these are the things that have been set out within the report Obviously, we've gone back to Environment Agency, and at this stage, they're happy with the proposal, with these objectives. More, more information will need to come in via the conditions that have been put on the safeguarding conditions. Um, but at this point in time, Environment Agency and the Council's Contaminated Land Officer are both satisfied that enough information has been submitted to um, say what works are potentially going to be carried out in order to mitigate. Obviously, it will have to be mitigated before people can live there. It's a, you know, for public safety purposes, we have to make sure the site is mitigated um, to an adequate um, level. So that will happen and that will come through the conditions. Um, in terms of your other point, in terms of landscaping, so this application, because it's in outline form at the moment, only for layout and um, access, we don't actually have a proper landscaping plan. So as part of a reserve matters application, details of that space, the compensatory land, will come in as part of that reserve matters application. So we'll be able to see at that point um, what 
how that land's going to be set out in terms of the landscaping, whether there will be any paths going through it or whether it's just going to be an excluded space just for the drainage and just for the low-level planting. In terms of the management of that, that will come through um, a landscape management plan. So again, there's a condition recommended for a landscape management plan to come in um, prior to any occupation of the development that will look at how that space will be managed into the future. Um, in terms of the highway points that you were mentioning, I mean, the, the access is being relocated in order to improve visibility to that access point. So highways have said that that access is, is safe because you can achieve adequate visibility. I appreciate members' concerns with the increased um, levels of vehicles that will come from the site. And I, I do understand because, you know, the bridge is quite um, narrow. There are, um, at the moment, there can be queues leading up to that bridge. But um, highways consider they've obviously compared it to the existing um, use of the open storage use, which, you know, could have as many vehicles. I don't know. The hot, it's a large site that could have open storage use, so you could have a lot of vehicles using this and HGVs as well. Um, and when comparing that, they're saying that the increase won't be significant and we can only object to something if there's a severe impact on the highway network. Thank you. Yes, I'm just going to bring Ian back in. No, just one. Sorry, just to add to Emma's point with regards to highway and, and capacity, obviously what highways are looking at is not that all of these 65 dwellings are suddenly going to go onto the network at the same time. I think that's an important point in terms of the idea of a percentage increase, is looking at the peaks and when there's more likely to be more traffic on the road. Um, just a reminder for members, obviously when it comes to matters to do with highways and potential objections, it's really key that there's evidence behind any objection on highways grounds and highways have gone back and forth on this especially with regards to the off-site works that are being proposed to try and improve the pedestrian crossing point as well as that access as well uh, with quite a lot of negotiation on it so thank you chair uh, thank you ian um councillor alban thank you chair uh, just to start off with in uh, you know i'm like everybody else in danny i've used that road and that bloody bridge uh, on a number of occasions, uh, nearly out of, 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 you know, because people are stupid and, uh, you know, try and go across there too fast. Um, I don't use it anymore. I go around the other way. Um, but I, I think that that is a concern and why, um, and why KCC don't put a traffic light system on either side of that bridge is beyond me. I mean, that, that's the way of dealing with that, but that's just my point of view. Um, I think from the contamination side, we, we have sites in both Margate and in Ramsgate, which were old gas sites, the same, the same as this, which are being, which have been and are currently being redeveloped and the contamination has been dealt with quite, quite ad adequately there and on, on both the sites. Um, and, and in the Ramsgate one, there is, uh, is an Audi gone there and there's housing to go on the other part of the, the site. Um, the site itself, I believe, is is adequate with the design that they've subsequently put in. The, the other design, I have to say, in the layout, did appear to be cramped. Uh, this appears, appears to be open. I can see no reason, apart from the highway issue, uh, for turning this down, Chair. Um, so I would support the uh, officer's app, uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Auburn. You took words from me about the gas works in Margate and Ramsgate. No? And so it shows you're as old as me. Um, Councillor Bayford. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I did have concerns about this application, but I have to say, I'll I'm um, very pleased to see that there is no enc encroachment on the green wedge. Um, <coughs> personally, where the highways issue is concerned, I, I could only see it as an improvement. It isn't good at the moment, that's absolutely true. I can't believe that highways would make a change that would make it make visibility worse or more of an issue. So uh, as far as I can see, that's a positive thing. Um, uh, as as Councillor Auburn said, I believe that the the site is fairly well, well, well laid out. Very pleased that uh, they've been able to reach the 30% affordable housing. Not so happy that it's 50% rental only, but can't win them all, perhaps. Um, in general, I think 
having heard the report, that I'm happy to support this application. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bayford. Uh, Councillor Crindon. Thank you. Um, having uh, worked for many, many years out on the uh, industrial estate next to the, the other side of this, um, I'm extremely familiar with the bridge. Um, I personally, unlike, unlike my colleague, prefer to cross the bridge rather than navigate trying to get out of the en other end into Beacon Road. I find it infinitely safer to navigate the bridge, which is actually, if you get into the middle of it, you can pass two cars in the middle of it. Um, however, like Councillor Hart, I am extremely concerned at moving the access nearer that bridge because not everyone does understand you can pass two cars in the middle and there is often a lot of queuing there and I'm concerned that there are an awful lot of family units in here that are going to be um, going off to school, work and, and things like that that is going to put a lot of pressure on that bridge. Um, and so I, I am very concerned at, at the decision to, to move the access uh, to that site nearer to where people are already quite a lot of people who do use it are quite stressed by it um as well as the pressures on turning out into vicarage street uh, which i think is no church road is it at the other end church street, church street um uh and potentially beacon road as well so that though, that's my issue thank you thank you i'm bringing back in just for a moment on a couple of points here council Quentin. Um, just, just to come back on the, the point about the access, I, I understand, I, I think it's, it's, it's clear that there is a, a concern about the bridge as it stands at the moment. I think just to clarify this point about the, the access, what is trying to be achieved here by moving the access away from the existing access is so that cars actually leaving that access can look to the left to see over the bridge to then be able to actually see to turn out to the right. Now, obviously, at the moment, if you use that existing access, which, again, is lawful by virtue of open storage, you can see here where that access is on the plan. It's the one to the south where you've got the... Uh, there's the arrow, actually, which points to it at the moment, which says pedestrian visibility. Um, you, if you look left, you cannot see from that existing access across the bridge. So any car turning off would potentially have conflict with users coming over the bridge. So the point here is that... You know, we have a, a highway arrangement with the bridge itself that is, is, is less than ideal, but fundamentally it's about whether or not the new access actually results in a, a, a potential highway safety harm. Now, there's actually an improvement in terms of visibility, in terms of where that access is. That's fundamental. It's, it's been evidenced by the highway professionals in terms of looking at visibility. So uh, we aren't, I don't think there's a, there's a value necessarily disputing that. I get the fact, though, that members are concerned about this. There are, obviously, the council's made a suggestion with regards to, in the future, is it possible to have traffic lights, for example, on the bridge? You know, that is something that highways, obviously, um, can look at. Uh, it's something that obviously comes through, actually, KCC councillors in terms of providing potential um, programmes for funding or use of funding that they're allocated. So it is something that could be looked at in the future, but it's not a requirement that KCC... Uh, suggest is as a result would justify as a result of, of this particular proposal. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, can't see. Sorry, Councillor Garner, you're down the end. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's interesting hearing what others have got to say. I re I realise this is in this is for outline approval, and uh, there will, there will be a follow-on application at, at some stage in due course to deal with reserved matters. Um, and I've heard what people have said about other British gas sites that have been successfully developed. I mean, I'm sure none, none, no two sites are the same. They might have been used differently. They might have different types of contamination. I would, if, if the committee does decide in its wisdom to approve this outline application, I would like to see at the reserved matters um, application details about what the contamination is and how it's being dealt with before any houses are being built and being occupied because I am quite sure that um, there are vents from beneath this site into farmland around the site that are releasing methane occasionally and that that 
when it was four or five years ago, it wasn't a viable site to be decontaminated without building extra houses. Now it is a viable site, apparently, to be decontaminated without building extra houses. I think we need to know exactly what the details of that contamination are and how that is being done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scarman. I think very valid point, and I'm sure you will be. Uh, you will be. The opportunity will be there, as it is for all of us when it comes about. Yes, I'll just bring back here, and then I'll come to Councillor Hart. Thanks. Just to clarify for Councillor Garner in terms of what you're saying about contamination. So, there is a, a, a precedent condition that's proposed, um, which is a condition seven, uh, which requires. Um, basically a, an additional risk assessment to come in uh, with a model that then goes through site investigation, results that site investigation and detailed risk assessment based in a remediation strategy. All of that has to go through the council's contaminated land officer as well as the environment agency, which has been requested by the contaminated land officer. Now that is timed that basically you can't start development on the site until that's come in, it's gone back and forth and it's been signed off. It's not proposed to come through the reserve matters application but to your point, the site can't be developed, it can't be occupied until that remediation strategy has been agreed and has been carried out. And there's a verification report that's required as part of that as well. And all of that has to go through both the contaminated land officer and also the environment agency. So we feel like it's covered, but it wouldn't come forward as part of the reserve matters, but it has to happen before any development takes place on the site. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Councillor Crittenden. Um, I, I just want to come back on, on this access point. Um, I do feel very strongly that actually, um, if only people have come down and actually looked at it, that moving it closer to where it is actually will make it more dangerous, um, getting in and out of there. I know how cars use that road. I know how, because I use it all the time. Um, and I just hope that if this goes through um, tonight, then that can be taken into consideration when any future applications are done and any reviews of it, that it would actually um, get a more detailed look at. Because I really do, from my, my regular use of that junction, um, I really do believe moving that junction nearer there is going to make it more dangerous. And I do feel that very strongly. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Hart. Thank you, Chair. I, I do agree with Councillor Crittenden and a couple of others here. I, I, th I think this is a very dangerous um, precedent here, that moving that junction even close to that bridge makes it more dangerous. I understand Ian's comment that if you're going to turn right, you can see better. Quite possibly you can. But you've got a big keep clear sign there, so you won't be able to actually get your car onto there. You've got to either stay back and who's going to go further forward because they want to actually get across the bridge. And I think unless... Can we put something into the into the application that makes Kent County Council or Highways, whoever deals with it, actually look at this after it's gone in to make sure it's a safe and sensible junction? Because all, there's quite a few of us here that all use this road. We're all concerned about that. And last thing I want is some kid running out or some parent with a child in their car being hit by some idiot coming across that bridge because somebody's deemed it safe to put the road even closer to the bridge. And I think if we could put something in there to actually to mitigate that, to make sure that highways actually look at it and make sure it is deemed safe, and if not, put in proper proposals to sort it out, then I'd be happy to accept the um, recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hart. Um, I'm not sure whether officers are coming back because I, I am aware that... Oh, one second, please. I know there's a walk way through bridge, isn't there? For walking. Yeah. Um, so there's, um, as there's off-site highways works that would be subject to a Section 278 agreement, um, there would be an assessment by highways about the works that's going on generally. Um, we're just double-checking um, the details of the application about whether or not a safety audit has already been carried out on it. Um, in terms of approving the development, um, that is something that has been checked in terms of whether or not it, it constitutes a safe access. Um, if you give us, if we could just have a very short two minutes just so we can just go through the highway's comments to just check this point if that's okay. You can have a, a two minutes, a very short two minutes, Councillor Alban. A short two minutes.
Thank you, members. I hope you're more comfortable now. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand over to. I'm going to hand over to Ian. Thanks. Um, apologies, members. Just wanted to double check. Um, in terms of um, condition six, which requires that no uh, sorry sixteen uh, that require no works will take place until offsite highways works um, as as illustrated have been completed. Um, what we um, would add to that, potentially add to that condition is uh, in, in accordance with uh, a safety aud audit in coordination with KCC Highways. Now, as mentioned, as part of the works to the highway, they need to get agreement from KCC, which means that, that this will be looked at. But to make it explicitly clear, uh, what I would suggest is that we simply add that wording in about the requirement for that safety audit into condition 16. Um, I appreciate that the motion on the table has that wording of the condition, but given that this has been mentioned, if the chairman and the vice chair who forwarded it, put it forward and seconded that motion would agree to changing that motion, uh, changing that particular condition to add in the safety order, um, then, then we would certainly endorse that. Thank you, Ian. Uh, well, Councillor Hart. Sorry, Chair. Chair. Sorry, Chair. Just to come back on Ian's point, which we all we all appreciate. Thank you for your time. Um, would that be would that safety audit come in after the houses have been built or before? Before, won't it? So it won't really make much difference at all. So realistically, they're not going to check on it after the forty-six or whatever it is houses have been built. So it really is going after the houses have been built. Yeah. If you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, the, the the safety audit would look at. It's not so much that the works, the offsite highways works have to actually be completed before the development takes place. So it will look at the use of that access when it's actually occurring. But but at, the, the requirement that highways have asked for is basically the, the works are completed to the highway before the development starts to ensure that all of the impact of the development is, is mitigated so you don't have the existing access being used whilst the houses are getting occupied. So what we'd suggest is that we, we get the safeguard in place so that we just get the audit to be checked by highways. Um, this preliminary design would have gone through a, a likely a phase one safety audit, but it is something that, that could be looked at with the very detailed design at phase two. Usually is looked at by highways. So for example, any roundabouts when they're delivered obviously have a preliminary design that we look at at a planning stage, but then when you get to a section 278 highways agreement, you get the real detail of exactly where the footpath ends and exactly where the telemetry goes. Um, so what we would look to do is add it into this condition, which means that before the works are carried out to both the junction, uh, as shown here, but also ensure that before any development happens on the site, that access is safe. So that's when we would try and time the development. Right, I'm quite happy to. Councillor Garner. Sorry, sorry to come back. I was, it's just some. Well, talking about the access on the roads, there's one thing that I just wanted to also mention that we haven't considered, which is the construction phase for this this um, development. Um, there's going to be an awful lot of large construction traffic needing to access that site. They won't, I assume, won't be able to access it over the single track humpback bridge um, because they might get stuck in that. So they'll only be able to access it from the bottom on Church Street, Vicarage Road, which is all already a sort of single file land. I just wanted to ask what consideration had been given to that, please. Thank you. Good point. Um, it's under condition 15. So very specifically, bef again, before any development takes place, there's a need for a construction management plan. Again, that would be checked with highways. Obviously, the existing use of the site may well use HGVs or could use HGVs for, for open storage. But we, we do think, again, the construction management plan, which is you know, a standard requirement for housing on this scale, but it is particularly important with this site because of where this access is and the existing access as well. So again, that would be something that would need to go through highways to be agreed again to ensure that it's things. It does include stuff to do with, say, you know, timings of deliveries because obviously, again, in terms of the build up on that junction, etc., to ensure that they're they're phased in a particular way. But but we do consider that condition 15 would would cover those points to go to highways. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ian. Right, I, I do propose that um, the addition for the, the safety um, uh, you know, of the junction is looked at further, as been explained by Mr Livingston. Could the Vice Chair please second that? I'll second that, yeah. Thank you, and I'm sure you, you agree. 
Right, I come to the main motion, which is uh, um, for the officers of recommendation to defer and delegate uh, for approval. Those in favour? Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you, members. That is carried. Thank you. I think a very good debate again. Thank you. Right, our final item on the agenda tonight is an application for deferral of Princess Margaret Avenue in Margate, which is agenda item 5C. Speaking in favour of the application, and apologise for keeping Mr. Ms. Humber, I beg your pardon, um, quite a long time tonight, but uh, Ms. Humber, you have three minutes. Uh, good evening, Chairman and members of the Planning Committee. <clears throat> Thank you for allowing me to address the committee tonight. I'll hopefully keep this brief as um, planning matters have been very well covered by the Planning Officer in the report before you tonight. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sharon. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous here. Um, and I've lived at number 41 Princess Margaret Avenue for 15 years with my partner Amanda and our five children, <clears throat> four of which are still at home. Uh, one is going to Kent University shortly, um, and three remain, um, and they are in local secondary schools. Um, <clears throat> 41 Princess Margaret Avenue is our dream forever home, and we have been very happy here. We thought it was important to be active in our local community by supporting our schools where, um, where I <coughs> sorry, became a, a local school governor at Palm Bay School, where all of my children went to. Um, my partner and I both work for the NHS. Um, I took retirement in the beginning of 2020, um, but returned um, very quickly when uh, COVID became very rampant. And really to support the local QEQM hospital, which was um, significantly overwhelmed. Um, I was also hospital um, governor for four years prior to retirement. Um, I remain there today part-time, um, but I have plans to fully retire, um, and as especially as Amanda is approaching retirement too. Um, our eldest daughter has finished her last year at university in London and plans to live locally, which we're very pleased about. Um, and we see this new dwelling um, as a way of creating a legacy for our children and helping our eldest onto the property ladder and to lessen her debt. Um, we have worked closely with all of your planning officers who have been very helpful in this process and we have amended our plans to overcome the concerns from our neighbours. Um, we do feel that small affordable dwellings in established and desirable residential areas such as ours um, are hard to find and this new home will, will help um, to meet an, an identified local housing need. By granting planning permission for this property, it will help the council to meet their housing targets and will help to alleviate the pressure of building new homes in the countryside. Um, it's a modest new dwelling, um, will, will not detract from the character of the area and will not harm the amenities of the neighbours. The materials we plan to use will be of high quality and sustainably sourced and hopefully local, well, I believe in that. Um, um, the new landscaping will be uh, biodiversity enhancement and we will add permeable paving, bird boxes, water butts to finish the property um, together with an electrical vehicle charging point. Um, <clears throat> as the planning report confirms this proposed development will meet all of the aim, aims of sustainable development and I truly believe that the proposed development does comply with government planning policy and with, our, um, with the Thanet local plan. Um, so thank you for your time tonight for listening. Uh, thank you very much. I know it's difficult not to be nervous. Um, I've been possibly corrected here. Is it Miss Humber? No, I'm Sharon. I own the property. Don't worry. Thank you. That's on my paper here. And congratulations for the work you've been doing for the NHS. And I think we all would agree on that. Um, speaking as your ward councillors, I have two ward councillors. Uh, Councillor Lees, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there are a number of concerns that I have with the proposal uh, that I'll be grateful for the committee to consider. Firstly, uh, as it's been pointed out in the on the objections on the portal, there are serious concerns with overlooking into neighbouring properties. Where the windows are proposed, regardless of if you frost them, once opened, will obviously be overlooking for established properties. Secondly, the report acknowledges that the footprint of the proposal is smaller than the surrounding properties. Indeed, 
Documents on the portal, namely street scene three, four, and nine, show exactly how much smaller the proposal is. The report states that this is mitigated by the proposal being set back, set back uh, further than the properties on the road. I believe that this will make little to no difference and will actually end up highlighting the differences between the houses. Uh, I'd urge members to look at these documents carefully and ask themselves if this is in keeping with the rest of Magnolia Avenue. Further to this point, Street Seat 9 demonstrate, demonstrates exactly how much of the garden for number 41 Princess Margaret Avenue decreases. This property has a garden and subsequent amenity space commensurate with its size. To approve this application would mean the garden of number 41 Princess Margaret Avenue more than halves in size, reducing the level of biodiversity in the area with it. Uh, if I could close by quoting uh, the reasons for refusal the last time this came forward, the proposed development by virtue of its location, layout, scale, design and subdivision of the existing plot and the relationship with adjacent neighbours would result in a cramped and discordant form of development within the street scene. I believe that this statement remains true of this application and would urge the committee to vote to refuse. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lees. Uh, Councillor Townend, do you wish to add to that or you have further comments? Uh, thank you, Chair. Evening, committee. Um, my colleague over here has raised a number of issues regarding this particular site. The development is in an area where <clears throat> there is already a considerable amount of congestion with cars. Uh, there, in order for you to give it a, a proper uh, consideration, your professional consideration, I would suggest that you know a site meeting might throw better light on the actual development of this other development on on the back of the garden. It's certainly, uh, there have been um, uh, developments in other people's back gardens over the years, but this certainly does throw up a lot of other problems that will come with that development. And I would recommend to you to consider a site visit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Townend. Uh, we can't decide on a site visit at this stage. Um, uh, that might come later. But ask um, our officer, which is Emma, to outline this report, please. The report. Thank you, Chairman. The application site is, is outlined in red on this plan. So this is Magnolia Avenue um, to the north of the site, and you can see Princess Margaret Avenue to the east of the site. So the land is currently forms the rear garden of number 41 Princess Margaret Avenue. This is an aerial view of the site. So this is the application site here. So you can see um, the garden depth, you can see the surrounding character of the area. So in terms of plot sizes, the properties at front Princess Margaret Avenue are quite large detached units with quite deep plots. But as you come into Magnolia Avenue, um, they are mainly bungalows um, and the plots in some cases are slightly smaller, especially on the southern side of Magnolia Avenue. Um, in this location here, you can see that opposite the site is um, an existing um, bungalow unit. So this is a, a more detailed aerial view of the site. So again, this is the application site here. So there's a substation in this location between um, uh, number 28 and um, the application site. So the proposal is for the subdivision of this garden area for the erection of a dwelling in this location here. So this is photos taken from Magnolia Avenue looking towards the application site. So the application site is in this location here. The properties on the right hand side of this photo are the bungalows within Magnolia Avenue. And then this is taken from Princess Margaret Avenue looking towards the application site, which is on the left hand side here. And then this is now back in Magnolia Avenue looking towards the application site in this location here to the left of the substation. Um, a view of the substation and the existing boundary treatment to the front of the site. Um, again, from Magnolia Avenue with the application site on the right hand side here. And then this is um, the site opposite the site. So you can see this is the existing bungalow opposite and the rear garden of the other property on the corner of Princess Margaret Avenue. That, this is now within the application site itself. So you can see the depth of the garden looking towards number 41, Princess Margaret Avenue. And this is showing um, neighboring properties within Princess Margaret Avenue and the existing boundary of the site um, in this location here. And then looking back towards um, the properties in Magnolia Avenue and the substation behind this hedging area here. 
and then this is just showing um, the general character of properties within Magnolia Avenue, which are, as you can see, are all smaller bungalow units. Um, but you can see there's quite small spaces between the units as well. So this was the a previous application. This is the layout plan for that application. The previous application was refused for three reasons. Um, one of those reasons was to do with the cramped development of the site, um, the fact that the um, it was quite a modest um, size unit, which was considered to be out of keeping with um, the pattern of development um, and the limited spacing to the boundaries from, um, from the unit. The second reason was related to overlooking from rear roof lights within the rear elevation of this um, of, of the proposed unit um, into the rear garden of the properties in Princess Margaret Avenue. And the third reason was a technical reason linked to the lack of um, a unilateral undertaking to secure the SPA contribution. These were the um, floor plans for the previous application. So you can see in terms of the first floor layout um, and in terms of the um, overlooking issue, there was a VLUX window that served a bedroom to the rear and a VLUX window that served a bathroom to the rear. So the rear window serving the bedroom would have been a clear window and there was concern that that would have resulted in overlooking. So the proposal is, is now this before you. So there is limited change to the um, proposal in terms of the size of the plot or the actual location of the boundary treatment. In terms of the um, changes, the proposal has been set back from Magnolia Avenue, so there's a one metre setback compared to the previous, which um, was in this location here. So it, there is a more spacious frontage to the development. Um, in terms of the um, rear elevation, there's also been changes to the windows and to the first floor layout. So this is um, the layout plan of the proposed unit. So you can see the substation on the left-hand side here, the proposed footprint of the proposed dwelling, the parking for one vehicle to the front of the site here, and then the boundary treatment that will subdivide the plot from number 41, Princess Margaret Avenue. This is the proposed elevation of the unit. So it is um, a chalet bungalow style, which is um, similar in ridge height to the existing bungalows in Magnolia Avenue. Um, this is the side elevation facing the um, property in Magnolia Avenue. And this is the rear elevation with the roof lights that are still um, proposed, but you'll see in a minute that they now serve different um, rooms. And this is the elevation that faces back towards number 41, Princess Margaret Avenue. So you can see there's no first floor windows within that elevation. So this is the ground floor plan. So there's a, a bedroom at, um, at the front of the ground floor. And at first floor level, the rear bedroom has now been turned into a dressing room and ensuite area to serve the master bedroom. So it's now proposed that these two VLUXs, which are high level VLUXs, would be obscure glazed and there's a safeguarding condition requiring um, that that would occur. Um, and you can see the roof plan of, with the uh, VLUX location. Um, in addition, we've had um, additional information submitted, including these um, these visuals of the proposal so you can see here quite clearly the spacing that would occur between the units so in terms of the spacing between the plots it's considered that this spacing is acceptable especially given the limited spacing between the properties in magnolia avenue and then another view there this is a street elevation level so again in terms of the height you can see that the ridge height is similar in height to the properties in magnolia avenue and then again, another view of the proposal. So in terms of design as well, the um, design similar with a, a small um, single story front gable projection, which again is characteristic of, of features that you can see with, within Mo Magnolia Avenue. And you can see the um, open frontage that is proposed as soft landscaping to the front here with just the hard surfacing for the single parking space on the left hand side. And again, this view here. So in terms of the um, previous application, it, it was um, refused on the grounds that it felt it was quite cramped. There has been um, minor changes which have resulted in the, the setback of the unit, which has increased the spaciousness to the front of the unit. Um, the concerns regarding the impact on the neighbours have been addressed and the um, applicant has agreed to the provision of the SPA contribution. So if this were to um, be recommended for approval by um, members that would come forward as part of a legal agreement um, following, following tonight. In terms of the actual site and the plot, there is still considered to be harm to the surrounding pattern of development of the area because the plot is still small. So the plot, as you can see, is to this location here with this fence here. So it is a small plot, which is smaller than other plots in the in the locality. Um, the setback of the dwelling would bring it 
in, um, in line with the front building line that you can see along Magnolia Avenue. And in terms of the street elevations that we've seen, it would be a street frontage development would fit in quite well in terms of the street elevation. So the main concern is the fact that there would be is quite a limited um, plot debt. So it is a balanced case, this one. Um, previously, we felt that with the projection of the frontage of the property towards Magnolia Avenue, it appeared too cramped. With that setback and with the other issues addressed, it's considered that on balance, the harm to the character appearance of the area is not considered to be significant, although it is accepted that there will still be some harm to the surrounding pattern of development of the area. So on balance, it is recommended for approval subject to the submission of the legal agreement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma. I move the officer's recommendation is adopted. The vice chair, please second. I'll second that, chair. Thank you, members. Councillor Garner. Thank you. I would like to go first because I've been first on the other one, so I wanted to keep a, a clean sweep of the whole track record to keep up. I mean, I have to say, I have to say, with 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 all due respect to my um, Cliftonville East councillor colleagues, um, I can see that quite a lot of thought has gone into into making this an acceptable um, an acceptable development in Magnolia Avenue. Um, it looks quite nice, quite good to me. It fits in well. Um, I will say, of course, I do, I do like the um, addition of an electric vehicle charging point, although that is a, obviously a minor point to take into consideration. Um, the, uh, the argument about biodiversity gain or loss I mean, I, it looks pretty even to me, if not a bit positive, because we've we've lost. Although we've gained that the property, we've lost the swimming pool, which wasn't a particularly biodiverse addition to the plot. Um, so, as you say, uh, it's quite a quite a, um, a a balanced thing. But I'm I'm happy to um, agree with the officer on this, and I will. Unless I hear anything to persuade me otherwise, I shall um, be supporting this application. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Garner. Councillor Hart. Thank you, Chair. I must hastily um, disagree with my Councillor, Mr Garner. Um, I, I think it's overdeveloped, cramped. Uh, it's just a shame to lose a nice garden for the sake. Very noble, let's be honest, to to build your children a house in the garden. That's fantastic, noble idea. But realistically, I think it, it's not right for that. It's, it's a nice, it's not even a huge garden. The garden suits the house. And to, to have realistically a handkerchief garden for a house of that size, I think it's a great shame. And, and to actually put something in that's that cramped in that area, I can't see that it's suitable at all. I'm awfully sorry. Thank you. Uh, any other members? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to put this to you, members. Uh, the officer's recommendation is to defer and delegate and approve. Those in favour, please show. Those against? <laughs> Abstentions? That has been carried. Thank you, members. Uh, please don't go away, but that has been carried. Um, that really